Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Savage, and I am the president of the City School District of Albany Board of Education. On behalf of the board, I welcome you to our meeting. I'm joined in person tonight by, and I will go from my right, Tanya Bowie, our board clerk, board member Almin Yawi, board member Mann, secretary of the board's tour, board member Wilson, board member Krejci, and superintendent Adams. Virtually, we have board member Smith, who is somewhere in the virtual world. I saw her smiling face a few minutes ago. So the entire board is here and ready to go. This meeting is being live streamed and the instructions to view the meeting are available as always at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE if you want to share those with anyone. We will show the relevant slides and documents in the virtual meeting screen as well as on the screens here in this room. You can also access them at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE if you prefer to be able to control the slides yourself. You will also notice that we are following the school district's COVID precautions, which are fewer than they used to be. Some of us are masked and some of us are unmasked, just as it is in all of our schools every single day. And we welcome people to do whatever makes them feel the most comfortable. With that introduction, we invite those of you who choose to join us as we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. In addition to saying the Pledge of Allegiance, we always focus our meeting by restating the mission of the City School District of Albany, which is to work in partnership with our diverse community to engage every learner in a robust educational program designed to provide the knowledge and skills necessary for success. And tonight, we have with us some very special legislative guests. Assemblyman McDonald is here with us as and Senator Breslin is here with us virtually and Alyssa Kane is here representing Assemblywoman Fahey. So we would love to have you make some opening remarks whenever you're ready and I'm sure we'll have a couple of follow-up questions. Thank you so much for being here with us. We appreciate all of your support. Thank you so much. I'm Alyssa Kane. Uh, a proud resident of the city of Albany, and I'm the chief of staff to Assemblywoman Patricia Fahey. She sends her sincere regrets uh, to not join you in person. This may be the only year that she hasn't joined you to talk about the budget and how unfortunate it is that this is such a good year for education in terms of funding, and she can't share that information with you directly. Um, she also is so grateful for the outpouring of support for her and her family, uh, shown by all of the members, as well as the uh, many, many staff of Albany City Schools um, who have shown um, her and her family uh, deep condolences during the loss of their son, Brendan. Um, I, she did want me to tell you, I, I will leave all the budget stuff to uh, the professionals here, um, but uh, I did want to tell you that um, she sends uh, this message. She says, remember to say I was a proud parent of two Albany graduates and Brendan wore his cross country Albany Falcon sweatshirt almost every day during his chemo treatments. Um, Falcons uh, came through and they were a shining example of what is great about the city of Albany. And so from the staff of Assembly Member Fahey's uh, and her family, thank you so much. I'm actually gonna defer to Senator Breslin if he wants to say a few words virtually first. First of all, can you hear me? Can you, can you hear, hear me? me? Yes. Okay. okay. First, First of all, I'd be remiss. Did this say say uh, our thoughts and prayers still go out to Pat, uh, having lost uh, a child after a, a, just an enormous two-year battle. Uh, and uh, we all know how uh, passionate whatever Pat is involved in. And when it comes to the health and, and the, the safety of her son, it was even more exemplified. And uh, our prayers will go out, not today, 
They will today, but they'll go out for many more months and years to come. So in terms of the budget, uh, I think I represent eight school districts. It's the first one that wanted me to appear because they're all as happy as can be and they're afraid I'm going to take away, we're going to take away money. Uh, secondly, uh, I'd say that uh, I'm sitting here remotely because uh, I, I always have uh, a St. An- Patrick's anniversary dinner with my wife. And uh, so that, that will <laughs> await my departure from here. Uh, I think, uh, and I might add, which I, uh, which I haven't, I go to a lot of events with uh, the school districts I represent from Rensselaer County, from Albany County. And I, I would say by far, this is the most involved school board, diverse school board, thoughtful school board, uh, not to the point of acrimony between and among yourselves, but always good arguments with the ultimate outcome to better the, the students of, well, of Albany High School and, and the entire city of Albany. And, uh, I, I, and I tell you again, I frequently, whenever I'm here, I think of my mom, who was a longtime teacher at Albany High, and my sister, who was a longtime teacher at Albany High, and the times that I was in Albany High, which a lot of you were way too young to the, remember the original Albany High, when I played sports there, and, and I, I think of it every time John and I argue for an additional $20 million to finish up the engineering school there, uh, and hopefully we'll get there this year. But uh, in terms of foundation aid, in terms of all aspects, uh, the, the, we've finally met the financial, I think, directionally, the financial commit, commitments that we were obligated to start and finish many years ago. So I'll turn it over to my dear friend, John. Uh, John and I had a press conference today. Uh, it's easy for him to stand for an hour and a half, less easy for me. Uh, but it's a critical time. We're going to, I believe, we'll pass an on-time budget. Uh, so far, I've been uh, pleased with the acting governor, or the governor now, and it's been refreshing to deal with her. Uh, she's willing to discuss issues, and, and really, the interaction has been uh, refreshing, uh, uh, and I have to remember what it's like to have it refreshing, and she's helped me do that. John? Thank you, Senator, and uh, President Savage and the board, and of course, Kuita, our superintendent, thank you for the opportunity to appear. You know, as Alyssa had alluded to, it is kind of a bitter irony there that we could argue be arguably one of the best budget proposals for the city of Albany School District. And Pat, who literally lives and breathes every single day for the district, is not here. But trust me, she's here in many other ways, in many other ways. And as one who communicates with her pretty much almost daily for the last 10 years, um, she, myself, and Senator Breslin could not be more pleased. Um, I represent nine school districts. This is my eighth school board meeting. My ninth one is in 20 minutes. And, uh, you know, I, I always make it a point, and this one's more special because it's with Pat and Neil, just to say hello and let you know what's going on. And <laughs> when I look at the numbers, I did a triple check, and I'm like, wow, that's a significant amount of money. It's a significant increase. But on the other hand, it's long overdue. It's significant because this community, above all the others I represent, and I can say this unabashedly, has the greatest need, but also the greatest potential. And as Governor Hochul committed to, I think on day three when she took over, we are going to make good on the promise that's been denied all these years on foundation aid. So between this year and next year, we are in a great spot, a great, great, great spot. Three or four years from now, maybe a whole different ball game. So keep that in the back of your mind. And I know that the number crunchers and the superintendent and the board members are very much aware that it's it's really the public that we need to be mindful of, right? Um, I do want to also share just a couple other tidbits and then I'll stop. Um, one item that this board has brought to my attention and Pat's attention and Neil's attention over the past couple of years and we're going to make some incremental progress on 
Uh, Albany was a very early adopter in UPK. And as Quita knows, as we had a press event a couple weeks ago, there are still districts in the state of New York that don't have UPK. Albany, thankfully, Cohoes, Waterbury, districts I represent, early adopters. But early adopters also are being shortchanged in regards to uh, aid per seat, as I like to call it. We are not going to correct it all at once, but we've, in our one house budget, included making a significant movement in that direction to make sure that every child has a chance. Every child should be worth the same. And that's really the principle that since three years ago, you brought it to our attention. Pat and myself have been really, uh, you know, the guys in charge of Ways and Means Education used to be 610. He's down to 47 now because we have just been really pounding on him. So I, I think that holds promise that that may bring additional support and long overdue. Um, you should know that we're adding another $100 million in community school funding to expand the program, but also to support cities like this that have had access to it in the past. And it will be about 20 to $40 million added, not confirmed yet, in regards to mental health, because we know that's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge with the adults. I know it's a challenge with the students. So with that, I know those are important aspects. I mean, uh, I want to echo uh, Neil's comments, and I know Pat shares the same sentiment, uh, particularly the last three or four years, the engagement with the district, with the board, the administration has been excellent. You guys have been very laser focused on the issues that are important to us. It helps us cut right to the chase. And quite frankly, I think you're starting to see some great results. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for being here with us. And Alyssa, thank you very much for representing Pat so uh, well. We have all, I believe, reached out to her individually, but we, we feel so hard, so deeply for her in the loss of Brendan, who was a very important Falcon, as well as such a special special human being. Um, so thank you so much for fulfilling the promise of Foundation Aid, or at least making part of the way towards fulfilling the promise. And thank you for recognizing that this is money long overdue and that it has held us back. Um, so while it is wonderful to see it come finally, it is, um, it's money that we've needed for, for some some time. Um, we are going to try and ask just a couple of quick follow-up questions. I think, Ms. Wilson, did you have a question? And Ms. Craigie, one of you guys, who wants to go first? Thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of you for coming out, out tonight. We were really happy when the Senate and Assembly budget bills came out to see that both of them increased funding for uh, pre-K education. And we noticed that the Senate is going to increase by an additional 250 million, the, the assembly by 150 million, and that some of that increase will go toward increasing support for districts with existing pre-K like ours, because uh, for members of the public who don't know, as Albany was one of the first districts in the state to implement pre-K, we get paid at a much lower per student level than districts that signed on later. And as a result, we use our own general fund money to supplement that in order to pay our teachers a living wage and retain our staff. So we're wondering, is some of that, how much of that money is going to go toward making us whole and bringing us up to the same reimbursement as the other districts? My understanding, and at least I can't speak for the Senate, and you know we don't know where the final outcome will be, but I think what we're focusing on is trying to raise that tuition per child, you know, try to incrementally increase it over the next three to five years. So maybe looking at a 20% increase over the next three to five years. That hasn't been finalized, but that is what our proposal is leaning towards. Um, we'll see what the final number will be in the next couple of weeks. That's great news. Thank you. Senator Breslin, we cannot hear you. Is it possible that you're still muted? I'm not muted anymore. And uh, I, I would agree with John that uh, we feel the same way. We can't penalize you for doing the right thing. And incrementally, I think we'll make you whole. But I also said that uh, from uh, the, this, the, the, two, the two budgets, the, the Senate one house budget and the assembly uh, one house budget, uh, don't view that we we are doing more because of that amount of money. 
One House budgets are very much, quote, aspirational, unquote. Uh, and I, I sometimes argue that we, we put in all the things we want to, to put in, uh, but that doesn't necessarily that we, we can do that. Our one house budget was about $9 billion uh, above the governor's budget, put in things that we've always wanted. And uh, a lot of times the ones who have been denied are, are school districts. But we've solved, I think, uh, ultimately, we've, sound, we've solved foundation aid. We're doing much for uh, pre-K. Uh, and then another area is uh, the child care, which really affects uh, school children very dramatically. I think you'll see an enormous amount of money placed in for the first time, an enormous amount of money that will, you know, and I'll digress to say that this pandemic showed the unfairness of our society. It showed the, uh, the inequalities very much in front of us. And hopefully that will be the lesson that we learn, that, that we're going to move very swiftly to make sure that we can eliminate some of those inequities that we've all known about, but they were right in front of us during the, the pandemic. And so I think, again, the final budget will be something that you'll all appreciate that we're moving towards the goal line and and uh, and you'll be happy with it. Thank you very much. Ms. Wilson, when you're ready. Hello, oh, thank you all. Thank you for your time. And that's a perfect segue because that my first question was going to be somewhat about around that, but it's great to hear that and about the 20, 40 million for mental health. Um, so my second question was, the ravages of the pandemic have highlighted the extreme challenge of being a teacher and not only an urban school district, but just overall. As an industry, we saw increased retirements or simply attrition into other fields. And it's estimated that the state needs approximately 180,000 new teachers over the next dec decade to meet workforce needs. It's evident our urgent priorities for our district, our region, and our state as it relates to education are develop an innovative supportive pathway for teacher aides and teacher assistants to become certified teachers, increase the diversity of the teaching force in high needs districts and schools and beyond because data shows that even non-black indigenous or people of color uh, benefit from being exposed to non-white teachers and address the teacher shortages needs in high needs districts and high needs schools. So recently Governor Holchel announced a plan that will incentivize teaching as a profession and create a robust pipeline for future educators, providing incentives for teachers accelerating the state um, under certification process. And I understand that NYSED had a teacher diversity pipeline pilot grant that was 500,000 over five years. So my question is, is there a way to significantly increase more funding for such a program or other incentives that could be devoted to this initiative, such as pushing it down to the high school acceleration program or even removing um, systemic barriers to certification? It's a very good question, Tabitha. Yes. There's, yeah, it's interesting, and I said this last night at the whole school board meeting, you wake up like three months ago and say, what just happened? Where'd everybody go? You go back four or five years ago, and superintendents know this, we had people clamoring at the doors to try to become a teacher because it was so hard to get those jobs. And to your point, the pandemic really just wore people down. They've decided, I'm done. And some of it deals with the demographic. We knew some of this was coming. I just don't think we knew it's the greatest magnitude. To your point, the governor has laid out and we are supporting several workforce development initiatives in many different aspects. You know, there's a, a large amount of uh, concentration going on in regards to the construction trades, a large amount of concentration going on in regards to workforce development initiatives geared towards the Port of Albany with the wind manufacturing facility, which is going to be between 330 and 500 good middle-class careers, not jobs, careers. We need to also triple down on helping bring opportunities for people to be teachers again. And to your point, there are a variety of different programs out there. You referenced one that NYSE supports. Um, what I think is even going to be more meaningful is unlike past governors, if this governor actually allows the money dedicated for the education department to hire people 
to help through the administrative process. This has been the dark secret that's been going on for a long period of time. Kawita knows this. Construction products are held up indefinitely because engineers and architects weren't hired to review projects. When it comes to curriculum development and guidance for these programs you talk about, if there's nobody there to help develop that criteria, you can't have the program. So our hope, the legislature has always been very supportive in regards to fully staffing the education department, which will help if done properly, because it's going to be funded, just that the jobs have to be released, will help in time create those opportunities you appropriately spoke about. I, I, would, I would just add to that, that uh, talking about the students and what's available, the poor jobs are going to be terrific, high paying jobs. We just had another announcement just over the, the bridge uh, from Albany to Bethlehem, about 1,600 new jobs, high paying jobs, which will, I think we have to keep our eye on them. Uh, and then in the teaching, I think the initial proposals by uh, Governor Hope will show that she understands the problem. She will do everything in her power to incentivize uh, the track to become teachers. Uh, and I uh, included in that is obviously going to be uh, health care workers. Health care workers are just uh, horribly underpaid, burned out, not willing to go back. And, uh, you know, they get to the point where they say, well, I can flip hamburgers uh, and make more money and less stress, so I'll do that. That's the time that we have to admit that we've done the wrong thing because we're not incentivizing those workers to do the right thing. And the same goes for the teaching profession. And same goes for mental health in the schools. Uh, I, I, when I told you I haven't had a lot of contact with districts who have been happy, doesn't mean I've been happy all the time when I see tremendous sums of money and I find limited mental health workers going to school districts in the same time their turf field has been done over. Uh, I, I'm offended by that in the terms of a priority. But we have to make sure our kids are safe and make sure our kids get all the services that are necessary. And we can't assume that school is like it was when we went there. It isn't. And we can't assume that they have the same kinds of problems we, we did. They don't. And we have a lot of work to do to stay on top of it. Well, thank you all for being here. I know Assemblyman McDonald, you have another school board meeting in five minutes, so that'll be interesting. You'll be the next Paul Tonko with your uh, <laughs> how fast right. you can get there. Um, but we really do appreciate your coming each year to talk to us at this time and particularly all of the work that you have done on our behalf. We appreciate the kind words about the commitment of this board and the um, efficacy of this board in our work with the legislature because we see it when we look at our budget and we see our reliance on local property taxes declining and our ability to rely on the um, appropriate progressive redistribution of the state dollars supporting our high needs districts here in Albany much more than they did five or six years ago. So we really appreciate you so much. Right. So if, if you have any closing remarks, we're open to them. Otherwise, we'll let you go. Right. And a closing statement, I would like to wish each and every one of you a very happy St. Patrick's Day, happy and safe. And uh, I will be able to fulfill my familial obligations by going to a St. Patrick's Day celebration. Enjoy. Thank you very much. And, and, and to everybody, thank you. And, you know, as many of you may or may not know, um, with the redistricting, I will no longer have the honor of representing the city of Albany or the Albany City School District. But know that you still have a friend. Uh, Pat and I obviously still will work very closely together because Albany is the center of the capital region. The capital city needs to be strong and successful. And at the same token, um, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years, but the relationships and friendships um, and the knowledge that I've learned from all of you is critical and will not be forgotten. So thank you. Thank you very much. We still may come visit you on Delegation Day because we still, we still think of you as in our corner. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa, your mask.
Um, and that is the end of our topic C, bringing us now to the superintendent's report whenever you're ready, Superintendent Adam. Thank you so very much, Madam President and members of the board. I would like to start by congratulating um, Coach Decky Lawson and the members of the Albany High girls basketball team on their championship season. The Falcons beat Shenandoah on March 5th to win their first Section 2 Class AA title since 2013. It was a joyful experience watching our student athletes compete and succeed at such a high level and also watching our community come together to support them. The team season came to an end last Saturday, last Sunday night with a heartbreaking overtime loss against Cicero North Syracuse in the state quarterfinals. Uh, but that doesn't diminish the team's tremendous success this season. Um, and if any of you were at the game or watched the streaming of the game, it was the scoring was neck and neck the entire game. And so everybody was like on the edge of their seats. And so we look forward to welcoming Coach Lawson and the team to an upcoming board meeting in order to celebrate their achievements. And we'll keep you posted on when that would happen. After an intense two day contest, the Albany High robotics team emerged Wednesday as the runner up in the 2022 New York Tech Valley First Regionals Robotic Competition held at the MVP Arena downtown. First robotics com competitions are the premier engineering challenge for high school students. Teams from around the world working closely with teachers and volunteer mentors have six weeks to design, build, program, modify, and test a robot to participate in a competition that changes each year. I was honored to join the members of Albany High Team 1493 when they celebrated the launch of the 2022 contest virtually in January. And I enjoyed the opportunity to catch up with the team in person on Tuesday morning as they prepared to start the competition. Albany High was among 41 teams competing this year with teams coming from all over the capital region and from New York and other states and from other countries. After the preliminary rounds, the Falcons had the highest score among all competitors heading into Wednesday's finals. For the finals, leading teams pick a group of partners Albany High's alliance included Tech Valley High School and Spencer Sport, I'm sorry, Spencer Port High School from the Rochester area. In the best two out of three I'm sorry, championships round, championship round, they matched up against an alliance that included schools from India, West Virginia, and Flushing, New York. The team split the first two matches, and Team 1493 fought hard up until the last second of the deciding match. Congratulations on the fantastic performance of our 30 students on team 1493. To our teacher advisors, Kevin Allen, Brent Cady, Andre Castagna, and Ken, I'm sorry, and Rich Kassane and Alan Landman. The mentor from National Grid is Jake Ennis. And of course, Ren the robot was the star of the show. You can see pictures from the two day competition on our Facebook page at Albany Schools and get a list of all the team members at albanyschools.org. We had another group of students participate in a competition and I would like to congratulate two of our Albany High School Skills USA CTE students for their outstanding performances Wednesday in competition at Schenectady County Community College. Michael Driscoll took second place in the food preparation competition and Cassandra Colton Hines took fourth in commercial banking. These competitions not only give students invaluable experience in their field with industry experts to guide them, but they also help the students build confidence to be able to see themselves in these careers after graduation. We are looking forward to supporting our CTE students in taking part in the Skills USA State Competition in Syracuse next month. Mother Nature unfortunately prevented us from having the opportunity to see our Marching Falcons back in action at the St. Patrick's Day Parade last weekend. Both 
at the North Albany, I'm sorry, yes, at the North Albany Parade and the city's main parade were canceled due to the snowstorm. The parades have been rescheduled for this weekend, but our talented performers unfortunately would not be able to participate because of the other related events that they will be participating in. Many of our marching musicians are taking part in the NISMA Festival on Saturday and our Winter Guard and indoor percussion teams will be competing in Syracuse. While we will miss them at this weekend's parade, we wish them well in their competitions. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to several community partners for their recent contributions and benefits to our students. We have received an incredibly generous gift of $100,000 from the Charles E. Tuohy Foundation to purchase diverse books for our students and professional texts for staff on the topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion in education. We thank you, Dr. Wilson Turner, for your uh, efforts in facilitating these donations. This donation will support the One Book, One School initiative in our elementary buildings. The chosen book is given to every child in the elementary building and administrators and staff develop age appropriate thematic activities for children to engage in throughout the school year. I would also like to express my heartfelt thanks to the TUI Foundation for supporting our students, our schools, and our community in this deeply meaningful way. The Albany Fund for Education, we thank them because they have partnered with 518 Asian Alliance and the Book House in order to donate 166 Asian themed books to our elementary teachers. Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction and Professional Development, Karen Bechtel, worked closely with AFE to coordinate this donation. The books have a value of $1,864, and we are very grateful for this gift as well. Our partners at the Albany Community Action Partnership, ACAP, recently provided two clothing donations that will greatly benefit our students. We will be receiving 75 new prom gowns from Macy's for our students to choose from this spring. These gowns are valued at $300 to $400 a piece. ACAP also is facilitating the donation of several cases of new women's clothing from Talbot's to help stock our clothing closets at Albany High, a Brook and Career and Technical Center, and Tony Clement Center for Education. I would like to thank our community engagement coordinator, Kathy Edmondson, for facilitating these donations. And we are so very grateful to ACAP, Macy's and Talbot's for their generosity. We also have received 200, I'm sorry, $2,500 from Global Companies LLC to support our girls basketball team. We will use these funds primarily to support our student athletes attendance at local basketball camps. Global Companies has an office in the South End, and we thank them for supporting our student athletes' growth and development in this way. A reminder to our families of students in grades three through eight that the annual New York State ELA exam is coming up at the end of this month. Test administration is scheduled for March 29th and March 30th. All students in the testing grades will have the opportunity to take the exam. This also will be a ca the case for the state math exams for grades three through eight, which will be administered at the end of April. You may check out the calendar of events at albanyschools.org for more information about this spring's state exams, including the recent regents and NYSLAT exams. NYSLAT, sorry, exams. Finally, we are so very excited to have our freight farm delivered to facilitate hydroponics in our curriculum. We hope that you were able to enjoy the photos on the website. Please take a look and we will have more information coming forward um, in some of our curriculum updates so that you can see all the exciting things with our freight farm. It is now my pleasure to introduce Principal Scott Thompson to share information about the great things that are happening at Tony Clement Center for Education. So please come to the microphone.
thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, board, for the opportunity to present this evening. And I'll just get started. So I'm going to start with our guiding principles. Uh, the vision at Tony Clement, uh, at Tony Clement Center for Education, students are empowered to realize their individual uh, aspirations, goals, and potential for greatness. Uh, the mission at Tony Clement. Uh, the mission of the Tony Clement Center for Education is to provide students with a safe, nurturing, and supportive educational experience that is responsive to every student's cultural, emotional, and social, social development. We ensure equity and access to rigorous and relevant learning opportunities through flexible and innovative programming, through positive relate through positive relationships and collaborative partnerships with our families uh, and community and each other, students will develop skills to become responsible citizens. As you're aware, uh, Tony Clement is a community school. Um, as a community school, our goal is, one of our goals is to have 100% of our students employed or participating in after school activities. This is a breakdown of our students, our demographics, um, with 83% of our students being African-American, 13% uh, of them being Hispanic, and 4% uh, of our students being Caucasian. Our staffing consists of our leadership team, which consists of me as the principal, uh, our assistant principal, uh, Teresa Dallion, and Ken Dittmer, our head of security. Uh, Centaria DePass Murray is our homeschool coordinator, and Marche Hines is our community school site coordinator. We're supported, our students are supported with our student support team, which consists of our psychologist, uh, Jacqueline O'Connor, our behavior specialist, Megan Britton, uh, social worker, um, Annika Dotton and Wilson. Um, our other social worker, uh, Sarah Murphy, and our Mediation Matters mediator, uh, Michaela Cargill. We're also, we also have 18 teachers, uh, three teaching assistants, eight security um, staff, uh, one food service uh, provider, um, a shared nurse, uh, and one clerical staff with another one slated to start tomorrow. So our set focuses uh, include the following, uh, an increase in ELA and math proficiency, uh, increase in our passing rate on the regents, um, as well as 100% of our students uh, being either employed or enrolled in after school uh, activities. Certainly we're not without our challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenge challenges that we've had this year is our student daily attendance. Um, our student daily attendance um, has been something that we've had to focus a lot on this year. And one of, in, on this slide, we have uh, some of the um, some of the uh, interventions that we actually employed, uh, which include incentives uh, through our PBIS program uh, for daily attendance and making sure students are on time to class, uh, phone calls home to parents, uh, referrals to our MTSS team, um, home, home visits, um, parent conferences, coordination with our attendance teachers and our court liaison, uh, community partnerships. Uh, we've also provided incentives through our PBIS program for our students and staff uh, that have been implemented to help improve the culture of our building um, and to help that infer and to help everyone feel that they're invested in our school community. Our successes consist of 42 students who are currently enrolled in our after school activities. Um, we have, I know it says on the slide 47, but as of this morning, uh, we have 50 students who have applied for our summer youth employment program with the goal of 100 uh, by the end of this month. So we're off to a pretty good start there. We have uh, 67 students who are currently enrolled in our SUNY Step Tutor Program. For those who don't know about the SUNY Step Tutor Program, is uh, SUNY Step Tutors are um, a uh, community partner that we have who um, 
actually provide additional academic support to our students in the classroom. So it's very important and really helps out. Um, and students at Tony um, Clement Center for Education just recently uh, during Black History Month spent uh, time researching um, Black Wall Street and then had the opportunity on and then had the opportunity on March 3rd uh, for our Black History Celebration to recreate Black Wall Street. Um, they did a fantastic job with that. So we're going to transition to a video. Uh, in this video, our assistant principal, uh, Teresa Dallion, uh, interviewed our students specifically looking um, or asking them um, for their true feelings about how they feel at Tony Clement Center for Education. While we're waiting, Mr. Dalian, if you'll please stand up so that they can see who you are. So thank you very much, and we appreciate all the hard work that you do. Thank you. just say um, it was important for us to um, do this video and I think one of the things that really stood out for me uh, with this video is giving student voice we talk often in the district about giving students the opportunity to to be heard and to have a voice and I think they did a really nice job expressing their feelings um, as it relates to their time here at Tony Connor. Take a quick moment. Um, TCC is supervised by Ms. Lori McKenna, who is on the line, and I just wanted to acknowledge that um, we appreciate all the work from Ms. McKenna and her supervision of the school. And as you know, Mr. Thompson was recently appointed as principal, and we are so very excited and pleased with the work that he's doing. So thank you all very much. Hi, my name is Kira. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center for Education. Hi, I'm Will Aaron Town, a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Shiron Morris, and I'm in 11th grade. Hi, I'm Markel. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm Jamal Hamilton. I'm a junior at Tony Clement Center. Hi, I'm
Sharon? I've been for about four years. Great. Four years since I was big. Thanks. All right, next question. What is the best part about Tony Clement Center? Um, smaller like classes and like you get more like one on one time with certain staff. Class of people learn the environment better. Uh, the teachers more helpful. Yeah, you know, I go with what he said. You know, less people out in Florida, less people, you know. So there's less distractions. Exactly, the less yeah. distractions. Well, you know, some schools have too much going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah less distractions. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, tell us a little bit about your biggest accomplishment here at 20 Climate Center. Um, I, don't, I made principal less, I haven't done that. Like freshman year. Wow. Made honor twice this year. Yeah. Uh, it's my first time. All right, tell us what you're looking forward to. Uh, graduating and getting out of Albany. Graduating. Yeah, get my diploma. Come straight to work. You know, get my diploma. Yeah, my barber certificate. I have to graduate that. Just finish the school period. I'll get that out of the way. I'm looking forward to graduating, going to college. Nice. Okay, if you could change one thing about Tony Clement Center, what would it be? Like the person. I'll, 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 about how people would I, 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 yeah, I changed the perception of how people look oh. at us and all that. Yeah, you know, how people look at us and the like environment in here. I would want more classes. More classes. At the high, I was taking like eight honors classes, and I can prepare classes that I've already taught in the Tell me too about more about the perception. When you say you want to change the perception of the of the school, what do you mean? Like how people think, like how people think of the school. You know how people always instantly think, oh, that's a bad school. It's really not a bad school. Like everybody good in there. Everybody, you know, graduating, passing, all that. Like, you know, which I say we is. So I like to change that perception of how people think of the school. Anyone else? I feel like you could focus more. Exactly. Like, I feel like, like I feel like this school is kind of like different from other schools, just over the fact, like because it's less people. Classroom, you know, we get that knocked out the way. So, and then after that, they give us the opportunity to do like classes that we want, like CTA classes, like Barber class. Like, so it's a good school, but not what they think. Yeah, they got the teacher that really care. Yeah. Yeah. At the high, you really feel that. That's helpful. Not other school, you know, like, they're not really just trying to teach you. They actually there to help you, like for outside of school, like, outside of school, like, outside of school problems. Problems ahead, you know. Okay. Well, I thank you all for taking the time, and you are all amazing, and you should know that. Peace. Thank you so very much, Mr. Thompson, and thank you to your students as well. And we appreciate everything that you all are doing. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will move right into our district update. And our district update tonight is um, going to focus on uh, COVID. Uh, we always start with our guiding principles as well, because as you know, we want to make sure that we are uh, making decisions and um, doing those things that align with creating those equitable opportunities for our students and those positive learning environments. Tonight, we'll talk about COVID. We'll talk about the cases and current protocols and then vaccines. And so as we move through to the next slide, um, the status update, uh, as we are right now, we are at 1,396 uh, confirmed cases, and this is according to our school report card. 
Uh, 1,020 of them are students and 248 faculty and 128 staff. As you can see, our daily average cases are going down, which is in the right direction. It aligns with what, ha what is happening in our county. And so we're very pleased to see that those numbers are going down. However, we still ask our families to be prepared for backup plans in the event that um, some of those numbers start to go up and we have to transition to distance learning moving forward. Testing, uh, we do partner with Quadrant uh, Biosciences. Uh, one of the things that we have to remember is that uh, we are still, uh, our, our employees that have reported uh, proof of vaccination, we're at 71.2%, no proof of vaccination, 28%. So we're happy to see that that number is going in the right direction. Uh, mandatory weekly testing for unvaccinated employees is still continuing and we have the time slots there. Um, and then it could either be done here or they can bring in the proof from another location. Our current protocols, just a reminder that there are no longer mask uh, mandates. Masks are optional and this is the protocol for the schools. Um, we do know that um, we want to make sure that we have environments that are mask friendly so that those who choose to wear a mask can and feel comfortable doing so and those who choose not to are comfortable doing that as well. Um, if a student, if someone does test positive though, we do have the mask for individuals who test positive. Those guidelines have been provided. Our desk shields in the classrooms, we have removed those. We've been, uh, we're still in the process of cleaning them before we store them, shrink wrap them, et cetera. But we've had, we have had some cases where there have been some parents that have requested that the shields be maintained for their children at their desk and we've given them that option. Social distancing is strongly recommended, but it is not required. Um, some of the areas where we are still um, kind of feeling our way through is in those larger areas like cafeterias, et cetera. Um, we have continued using classrooms for lunches because we found that there were some students who were, you know, there's too many, I'm uncomfortable going into a large area to eat, I'd rather stay in a classroom and eat with the teacher that's supervising us, et cetera. And so we have also allowed that as well. With regard to the COVID-19 exposure, quarantines are no longer required for individuals who have been identified as contacts or who have been exposed. And we are transitioning to that language as well. We still notify uh, if there is a positive case and then there's a six foot radius with regard to being exposed, we still notify families of that. However, it is still not a requirement that they are quarantined unless they also test positive and then they would have to. Um, we do look at the minimum, I'm sorry, the maximum of five days out of school and then they can test to return. And if they return between days six and 10, um, they are required to wear a mask, et cetera. We are continuing to encourage everyone five and older, if you're able and eligible to please get the vaccination. We have provided information for that. Um, appointments at Crossgates Mall, you can click on that link and, and make sure that you get an appointment. And then additional locations, you can go to vaccines.gov or call the number on the screen. Any questions? Board colleagues, this is fairly familiar in material with just a current update. Does any board member have a question for the superintendent? Board member May. First, it's a comment and then a question. Um, the comment has to do with um, proof of vaccination, how that number continues to go up for staff. I think it's amazing. Um, the question I have has to do with getting the results back from Quadrant. Are we getting them back in a timely fashion? We do. We get them back in a timely manner. Um, it could be up to 48 hours sometimes. Um, at the most, it might be three days, but typically we get them back in a very timely manner. Okay, good. Thank you. Anyone else with a question at this time? Board Member Uh Thanks. I just had a quick comment, and it's uh, just in light of what's going on in Europe and Asia, where, we're, where they are experiencing increasing cases, and there's a variant that's extremely contagious. I think it would be great if we can continue to focus on ventilation. And I'd like to suggest that we that we in, 
that we investigate portable air purifiers for each classroom. My understanding is they're reasonably expensive, maybe $100 a piece or so, and they would be great not just for COVID, but for any other infectious respiratory type diseases and also for students with asthma or allergies. That's just my plug. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Otherwise, then I think we'll turn now to public comment. This is the time we set aside to hear from members of the public. Those of you who do not come to board meetings often may not know you need to sign up. If anybody meant to sign up to speak, there's a sign-up sheet near Ms. Bowie. The board always welcomes input from the community about the decisions we are making. For our long-standing policy, the board sets aside up to 30 minutes of each meeting to hear from district residents, parents, students, and other members of our community. If there are more comments than can be accommodated in 30 minutes, we may choose to extend the length of the public comment period or alternatively to establish a second public comment period later in the meeting. It does not look like that will be necessary tonight. Per our new public comment policy, we also accept comments in writing, by virtual live participation, and by voicemail. Comments that are not in person must be made at least six hours prior to the meeting to give us time to collect and verify them as needed. Written comments are limited to 400 words and voicemail comments to three minutes. All comments must always include the commenter's name and place of residence. We do not accept anonymous comments. If you would like to submit a voicemail or a written comment for a future meeting, we encourage you to review the addressing the board information at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE, which would also give you the instructions about how to sign up for virtual live public comment. We do ask all commenters to keep in mind that information about individual students and specific district staff should not be shared. Not only is that a violation of privacy, but every student and every staff member which deserves to know that concerns about them will not be aired in public. For that reason, board members who read written comments will pass over or substitute alternative words if individual names are mentioned. We will also eliminate those names and descriptions from recorded voicemails when they occur. Also, we ask that you keep in mind that public comment is not the best place to first alert the district to a concern you have. We ask that you share concerns first with relevant staff, such as a teacher or principal. If you feel the concern is not addressed adequately, you may appeal to that person's supervisor up the chain of command, if necessary, to the superintendent, and decisions by the superintendent may be appealed to the board. We do not have any voicemail comments tonight. We do not have any in-person comments tonight or virtual comments, but we do have quite a few letters. Uh, I think uh, we tallied around 17, and we are going to read those now. Please let us know if we mispronounce your name. We really try hard. If you're listening at home and we're reading your comment, or if you're here and we're reading your comment, we try really hard to pronounce people's names correctly, and we appreciate it if we are corrected. So I'm going to start with Ms. Smith, if you're okay with that. Ms. Smith's going to read virtually. She's got a handful of letters to read. Actually, she's not going to read virtually. She's going to really read, but she is virtual. When you're ready. Okay. Thank you, and I hope you can hear me okay. Okay. Uh, my first uh, letter comes from Jessica Usaltis, who writes, after reflecting on last night's forum, I'm not sure this process has given thorough consideration to the needs and realities of dense urban neighborhoods. <clears throat> Downtown Albany residents often don't have driveways, cars, yards, or homes with their names on the deeds. Their parks, shops, libraries, and schools are their backyards, their resource centers, their lifelines. To sever these things from the local community and place in the hands of other more distant ones is poor planning at best and dismissively cruel at worst. Yes, for downtown toast families, having a walkable option for elementary and middle school seems like a luxury and not a necessity. But tomorrow, many of these families for whom agency is often limited and choice is a rarity will wake up to one less option, one less thing that makes their lives just a little easier so that other families somewhere else can have a shorter bus ride. Thank you. My next one, <clears throat> excuse me, comes from Stephanie LeVay, who writes, my children are both currently going to toast. My oldest, we were expecting, would be going to hack it next fall. Neither I nor their father own a char car. We are a family of walkers. Deciding to live in close proximity to their school was purposeful to that effect. I know I'm not alone in this. Many live close to the two schools for this fact. Removing our choice to send them to Hackett puts 
unnecessary financial and physical burden on those families. Okay, thank you. The next is from Colleen Smith Lemon, who writes, Dear district staff and board members, I firstly would like to say that I do applaud your intent to address the inequities within the three middle schools. I do recognize that there needs to be a more academically balanced population at each school. However, I need to say up front that addressing inequity in our school system cannot begin and end with changing middle school feeder patterns. There needs to be a much more strategic, broader approach. I encourage the district to start sharing these broader plans with the public now. That being said, changing feeding, feeder patterns requires a lot of time, planning, direct public outreach, and communication to be successfully explained to parents and implemented. There were a lot of flaws with how this process was laid out in the beginning, lack of, satisf satis excuse me, lack of statistician support from beginning, sending out surveys and material that are not written in plain, simple language, lack of targeted outreach to disadvantaged communities, the way that two scenarios were added to make the process appear fairer for one school, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on. Optics are so very important with a process like this. In the 310 board meeting, I heard the needs of the New Scotland students mentioned the most 15 times, much more than other schools. This made it clear that this decision was going to be made based on the needs of those most vocal and politically active. At the end of the day, politics are the deciding factor. Regardless, whatever feeder pattern is chosen, I implore you to develop a better plan for implementation, which includes meeting with the families from the schools that are most, oops, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, meeting with the families from the schools that are most impacted by the change to help develop plans to address all their concerns sharing transportation routes and plans with families early. Parents are mostly concerned about transportation as there are challenges with current tripper buses. Most importantly, communicate about transportation and any plans, um, communication about transportation and any plans should not come from the Times Union. You do not build trust when information is published secondhand in a format meant to persuade rather than inform. Thank you again for your efforts. I know the intent of this change is to achieve more equitable outcomes, but so much more planning and education needs to be done. Thank you, Colleen Smith Lemon, um, Eagle Point Elementary School, and Harriet Myers, mm, that's not right, um, Hackett Middle School PTA member. My apologies. Um, my next <clears throat> comes from Kimberly. Uh, Ruchel, or Ruchel, I apologize, who writes, good evening, board members and district staff. I've spoken and written on this subject several times already, so I will be brief. I once again ask that the feeder alignment process remain objective as much as possible. The goal is to provide equity to our students, and that can't be achieved if the process is biased or focused only on one or two schools. I understand, respect, and share the concerns of the families who have voiced fears and anxiety about transportation and violence in neighborhoods, but I recognize that the board and district will make every effort to keep our students safe. Please do not believe that silence from certain schools or individuals equates to acceptance. One of the wonderful things about Albany is its diverse population, but this means that there are also large populations of ENL families and those who are disadvantaged and lack the resources to voice a response. This is not an easy decision and people will be upset no matter what, but I am once again asking that it remain objective and equitable. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, my next one, and I will, uh, if you bear with me, I'll try to uh, read first in Spanish and, and then in English translation and uh, this comes from Mary Chuki, uh, who writes, Buenas tardes, desculpe y motivo de mi trabajo, no he podido estar siempre informado, informada de todo, pero gracias 
y ahora estoy informada por lo cual les rogaría de favor. This is my. Uh, de favor que se quede aquí dual language y se quede en Hackett ya que ese fue el plan de desde un principio. principio. Um, she writes, good afternoon, I'm sorry because of my work, I haven't been able to be here. I've always been informed of everything, but thanks, now I'm informed. Uh, so I would ask you to please stay there, meaning dual language, to stay at Hackett, since that was the plan from the beginning. Thank you. Uh, my next <clears throat> uh, comes from Johanna Jimenez, who writes, Hola, mi nombre es Johanna Jimenez. Envío este email para hacerles saber mi descontento y preocupación sobre los próximos cambios. No estoy de acuerdo al igual que otros padres a que mi, mi hija esté en otra escuela que no sea Hackett Middle School ya que considero, considero que la escuela adecuada para el programa bilingüe. Um, hello, my name is Johanna Jimenez. I send this email to let you know my discontent and concern about the upcoming changes. I do not agree, like other parents, that my daughter is in a school other than Hackett Middle School, since I consider it the right school for the bilingual program. I prefer my younger children who attend the dual language program currently at AIC to attend Hackett Mills School at the same time. Thank you. Let's see. I believe the Savage President Savage that that is it for me and thank you for your patience. Thank you very much and I appreciate your reading in Spanish as well as in English. Very much appreciated. Board Member Chatur, when you're ready. The first letter is from <clears throat> Rudolf Rose. Uh, 67759C is an okay choice, please, but please reconsider 25828A. The second letter comes from Stacy Stump. As a toast parent, I was disappointed to see that the final two scores being considered have moved toast to Myers. These two scenarios also have the highest proportion of long distance economically disadvantaged workers against the stated goals of the committee. This action will have devastating consequences for Toast. I'm asking you to reconsider. Hackett is across the street from Toast. Toast parents and Hackett parents have shared in common have shared in common frustrations the past two years as a wastewater facility has brought construction, explosions detonated during school hours, and heavy traffic to a common block. But we have stuck through these hardships together because we are a shared community and await the promised improvements to Lincoln Park that both schools will access. I hope that the two schools can continue their strong history of shared resources, including having two students cross the street to their future middle school to see the musical being performed and enjoy second grade swim. Please add this back to the budget. Drowning is a second leading cause of death for children. It is enormously helpful as children transition from elementary school to middle school to be familiar with their new environment. And this was the major benefit Toast was able to offer to its students because of its proximity to Hackett. And now it seems the relationship between the two schools will be severed. Toast is a diverse school that reflects the demographics of the city and part of the reason is its location. It's near public housing projects and low rent apartments that house a significant number of the Toast population. Many of our parents are new English language learners who may not even know that this process is going on. They will be blindsided to figure out how to be in two places at once next year as both schools start at 8 a.m. Many Toast children are picked up by older siblings from Hackett. Many children at Toast participate in the Boys and Girls Club, also located right across from Toast, and look forward to continued participation as this club expands its programming to provide a safe place for teens. A large portion of a population do not have cars and need to use public transportation themselves 
within school events. These are the families who need our district resources, attention and convenience. The next letter is from Matthew Reed. I'm concerned that the criteria that the board and the feeder committee identified as driving this process has been ignored in narrowing the eight choices down to two. There are three scenarios with the lowest composite scores, which I understand to mean that those scenarios most closely align with the stated goals of the realignment. 25822A, 25822B, and 76882A. However, only one of those scenarios, 25828B, is being considered among the final two. In the scenario that most closely meets the realignment criteria, 276882A is no longer being considered at all. I do believe that the community input is an important part of this process, and I understand that the survey was meant to elicit those responses and provide that input. However, I'm concerned that a scenario that is now considered a finalist seems to be seems to solely be considered as such because of the high percentage of survey responses from a relatively affluent area of the city and large and influential elementary school. Like other parents who spoke at last night's forum or have voiced their opinions in other ways, I have significant concerns about the efficacy of a survey that was so disproportionately responded to by certain communities, but virtually ignored by others. If community input is truly a valuable part of this process, I think greater efforts need to be made to get honest feedback from a broad range of parents from all elementary schools, communities, and neighborhoods. Again, I know the purpose of the survey was to do just that, but I think the results indicate that those efforts to receive comments and input from a wide range, a wider range of families fail. And perhaps another means to accurately gauge community input is required. If different and more effective efforts are not made, I don't believe the community input received thus far is truly valuable. And if the board intends to proceed as planned, they should instantly rely more heavily on the data and the composite scores. The next letter is from Kira Thompson. I applaud the board for their efforts to create a more equitable learning environment for our students. We live in one of the most segregated cities in the nation, where racial divides in access to health, nutritional and educational opportunities are a reality for our kids. Thank you for striving to address these critical issues. However, I ask that the board please consider delaying implementation of the new middle school feeder plan one year or until forthcoming and existing transportation issues can be anticipated and addressed. In particular, Effort should be made with CDTA to decrease commuting times for our students. Delaying implementation may also soften the abrupt change to daily routines that many district families may experience. And since the data used to inform the scenarios were gathered during COVID, when school attendance and student families family challenges were abnormal, an extra year to collect and analyze new information may be useful. Finally, I'm concerned that the distance and difficulty in getting to middle school far away from student homes perhaps requiring long walks and or bus transfers may hinder family and community involvement. As the board well knows, family and community engagement is an enormous component in successful student learning. The next letter comes from Jenny Morton. Our son attends Eagle Point, and I'm very concerned that he will have to travel so far to North Albany to attend middle school. I truly believe this would be a disservice to the kids at Eagle Point. Please look at other plans that involve Eagle that involves Eagle Point students ending up closer. Thank you for your time. The next letter is from Rachel Pullman. I wanted to express, express some concerns I have as a parent of two fifth graders in the district, the parent of a child who I pulled from the district middle school. I'm concerned that the plan to shift one class at a time will adversely impact the youngest kids in the school. Will triple buses service the same neighborhoods yet different schools? How will it feel for 11 year olds to be the only kids from the elementary school at a new school? I worry about bullying. I feel that the scenarios being considered are not taken into account how parents are to engage with their newly assigned middle school. It is not just the kids you want at the school, you want the parents. Some parents have cars, but in a city, many don't, do not. Certain of the schools are much easier to reach via public transportation and long rides make even the easier to reach schools a trek. Long commutes will decrease parental involvement. Nothing new was built. You have the same admin in place. You have the same programs in place. And yet somehow shifting the students for exclusively sixth graders for now is expected to change the school climate. Is there any study that can be cited where that happened? I'm concerned about attrition this whole feed alignment only works if your student body is willing to be realigned. 
The student body is given a reason for why the realigning will be a good thing for their kids. I believe more parents are not so altruistic that they will send their, ch their kids into scenarios that, con that they concern them for some greater good. Making every middle school the same is not workable. There's an assumption being made that if the high needs population were to be more evenly distributed and the high achieving population were to be more evenly distributed, that this would be helpful. With Albany's current staffing challenges, I think it's unrealistic to assume that the ACSD can staff the same programs at every school. Why not distribute the programs and supports, assign kids to schools with the programs and supports that they need? I'm concerned about the property values in all of Albany going down because prospective buyers will learn that the assigned middle school is an hour away from hour away by bus. Regards, Rachel Cohen. The last letter comes from Jennifer Morton. After sitting through several board meetings and feeder alignment meetings, including the final meeting held on 316, it is both surprising and disappointing to see the concerns of a single neighborhood elementary school dominate the narrator in such a manner. As I have written and said before, this board should not rely so heavily on a survey that is heavily influenced by a single group, especially since that the survey was released and remained open after the board published narrowed down scenarios for the middle school realignment. It seems that the vast majority of board members live uptown and in uptown neighborhoods. All of us parents are asking that you make the best decision for the district as a whole and not cater to what the largest voice is shouting for. The decisions of the district should not revolve around what New Scotland Elementary wants to see happen. Achieving equity is about leveling the playing field so that the, so that the block you were born into does not affect the quality of education. That's it for me. And our last reader tonight is board member Krejci. Thank you. The first, the first uh, letter I'm going to read is from Michael Woodhead. And I just wanna say, uh, Mr. Woodhead does refer to two specific personnel in his email. So for that sentence, I'm gonna paraphrase. And I'll let you know in advance what, what sentence I'm not reading literally. Okay. I would like to send full congratulations to the members of the admin staff who not only were shielded from the massive staff cuts last year, but who were rewarded with pay raises. I was under the impression that the district just did not have the funds to pay people because of the outright refusal to pay the cleaning and support staff even $15 an hour. Okay, here's my paraphrase sentence. Teachers, schools have a hard time retaining teachers, but we give cabinet members raises. Okay, now I'm gonna go word for word again. Was the six figure salary not enough to keep up with inflation? It just amazes me that anyone can look at the job being done and think, Yup, this deserves a raise, especially when those salaries were already three to four times what a single teacher makes. The level of contempt this district has for its teachers is astounding. You just sent a message that there is more than enough money to pay the administrators, the ones who have zero interface and interaction with the students, but everyone else who is actually involved in doing the work is worthless. All in for Albany is such an empty, hollow, and insulting slogan and should be taken down. The board and admin are all in for themselves, not the students. And before you say something like, we have no choice but to pay because it's hard to find replacements, save it. You don't seem to care about that when it comes to firing teachers and support staff, and they contribute way more to the district in education of the schools. Maybe it's time to look within and see if there are any educators that might be interested in bringing new outlook and ideas to the administration. I bet it would come with a lower price tag and it would be refreshing to see people in the admin office who have actually taught a class in the last decade. This board and administration have failed the community and you continue to double down on an admin that clearly has no idea what they are doing. Sure, they work hard, but you can work hard and still be bad at your job. Perhaps it's time to acknowledge that fact. Okay, next message is from Jenna Patera. I'm gonna take this off, it's a little hard. The Center Square and Hudson Park neighborhoods of Albany have some difficult schooling decisions. Giffen is an extremely long walk for a small child from our neighborhood, but it is slated as our neighborhood school. It's along a busy road and no bus is available as we're all within the 1.5 mile radius of the school. As a result, nearly all of my neighbors choose a magnet school. Toast is a reasonable and much safer walk. 
Ash and Montessori offer busing op options for people in our neighborhood. We split our kids up and go through the lottery anxiety because while Giffen offers great educational opportunities, it is not very accessible to our neighborhood. When the eight scenarios for feeder realignment were sent out, I was excited, especially about scenario 25828A, which kept toasted Hackett, which is right across the street from it, Ash at Myers, which is, right ne which is next door, and Montessori at Hackett with a diverse and well-represented collection of schools. When a second survey was sent out about the eight options, New Scotland parents or families organized and flooded the ballot box. Their neighborhood is used to accommodation. They have a highly walkable, high-performing school and easy busing to hack it currently. They did not want to see changes. A Facebook group was created. They advocated hard for the two scenarios that continued sending them to hack it, even though these two scenarios made much less sense and caused much more upheaval for many other schools. I was so excited as a Hudson Park resident to learn that theater realignment could leave my son walking to school with the kids he lived near. I felt like this was a moment to really see the transportation issues that affect Center Square Hudson Park could be quelled. It feels like by narrow narrowing two scenarios, 25828B and 667759C, the board is kowtowing to a vo vocal and highly resourced minority. Please consider 25828A. Giffen, Toast, and Delaware should be at Hackett. It's in their neighborhood, and these schools have much larger populations of lower-income families that need walkability. Ash should be at Myers. They're practically on the same property. It is clearly the best option. Please don't ign ignore the needs of our neighborhood just because we made less noise. The next message is from Vesna Kaken. In the interest of actual, rather than perfunctory, transparency and effectiveness of the pro this process, I urge the board to name which of the two criteria the district finds relevant in making the decision. One, the majority of parental votes for a particular scenario, or two, equity. In doing so, please also provide evidence on the basis of which you have been prompted to name this particular criterion. The evidence should come in the form of at least one relevant peer-reviewed study that takes into account the well-being of the children and the families whose lives this criterion and your decision affects. Thank you, Vesna Kagan. Uh, the next message is from Dana Kowalczyk. Dear Albany School Board members and school community, I was looking forward to being annoyed about the school community being asked our opinion and then having our opinions being completely ignored as a standard with this type, these types of surveys. I am surprised to find that this isn't the case. Instead, the loudest parents are being catered to, equity be damned. Based on the reported information, the most responses came from New Scotland parents. While they may be the largest school, the community is also arguably one of the most white and resource rich in the district. It makes sense that the whitest, most resource rich people have the most time and ability to access this survey. I'm wondering how equitable the questions and administration of the survey actually are, especially when their responses are what is determining the outcome rather than research based equitable practices. There are so many working class families, one car families, no car families in our district who need walkable access to school. If catering to their needs first is the most equitable because resource resource rich people have options like driving their kid if they don't like the bus ride or moving to Clifton Park if they don't actually want their kid going to school with black children, then that's what you need to do. Or maybe that's not the most equitable way to do this. I don't know because I'm just a parent, not an expert on education and equity and busing. I don't care which middle school my children attend. But I do prefer it's not whichever school is attended by the unfortunate children of the grown adults who are selecting whichever option means their kids don't have to ride a bus too long with poor kids. Please reconsider and do right by all of our children. Sincerely, Dana Kowalczyk. And the last message I'm going to read, oh, two more. The next one is from Aaron Boyce. I appreciate the effort that the committee is putting in to consider a number of dimensions of equity in middle school education. A feeder pattern that is equitable will create middle school communities in similarly outfitted facilities that are similarly broad and diverse in regard to socioeconomic, 
racial, ethnic, and academic factors, and similarly accessible by foot and bus for the most students. It's important to consider representation and methodology when making this decision, and I am concerned that an unscientific, unverified, and non-secure online survey will carry too much weight in the decision making. As a way to see what's in most important to parents and members of different schools, sure, it's useful. But should the feeder options be narrowed down from these results? If so, how? The input should be used to inform evidence-based decisions by experts, which self-interest parents are not. In examining the slides from the March 10th meeting, two scenarios were identified on slide 34 as having a desirable fits well to fits poorly response based on the preliminary totals, 25828B and 67759C. However, these results also show that one elementary school submitted more than twice as many votes as the next elementary school, and that three of the top seven responding schools were not elementary schools. What weight should those responses carry? When the total fits well only ranges from 23 to 33, is that score meaningful? Further, when looking at the first and second highest fits well choices from each school, 25828A and 67759C fit well for eight schools, and 25828B, 26225A, and 60348B fit well for seven schools. Point being, you have a lot of raw data, data at your disposal. I hope that you have experienced quantitative analysis is working with it because it appears that the two scenarios identified on slide 34 on March 10th may not be the best fit for the most schools. I encourage you to carefully consider fits well and fits poorly for whom. From my perspective, this, fit, this fits well opinion should matter most for populations who have the highest needs and should matter less for resource rich populations who are more likely to own cars and have driveways in two parent households. Again, I appreciate the effort that is going into this and the focus on achieving equity. Also, that en open enrollment may be available for students who simply want to walk to a middle school in their neighborhood. The last message is from Jessica Brown. My son attends Montessori Magnet School. I am opposed to sending him to North Albany Middle School as there are two other middle schools much closer to our home. I am concerned about the length of time he would be spending on the bus, how it could affect getting to after school sports and activities, and the safety of the buses in general. Being a single full-time mom with a full-time out of home job, driving my son to and from school would be very difficult with my work schedule. And uh, did I read, I don't, two more. I had two more. Did I read the one from Jenna Patera yet? Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, I did. Thank you very much, that is it. All right, thank you very much. We do appreciate all public comment and we find hearing from community members extremely valuable. Again, our contact information for both public comment and routine correspondence is at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE. We now move to the part of our meeting we call routine consent. During this portion of the meeting, we approve routine matters for the district. These include items like contracts and field trips, personnel matters and the like. Each board member reviews each item carefully, but we vote on them as a group with no discussion. That allows us to use our meeting time more efficiently. Nonetheless, each board member has the option to set aside any routine consent item in order to require a separate discussion and a separate vote on that item. With that introduction, I now entertain a motion to adopt the routine consent agenda. Motion by board member Wilson. Do I have a second? Board member El Minyawi. Are there any set asides? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the routine consent agenda in its entirety, that is unanimous. Thank you all very much. And that brings us now to our first action item, which is the EPC resolution. Uh, Superintendent Adams, is this Deputy Superintendent Ron? Good evening again, and thank you so very much. At this time, I will turn this over to um, Deputy Superintendent Roaring. Good evening, Board of Education. I'm pleased this evening to uh, introduce several of our partners. Um, with us this evening from Day Automation, we have Josh Edinger and Steve Hayslip. They are going to uh, once again review some of the components of the EPC with you. And we also have with us tonight on behalf of Fiscal Advisors, Andrew Schrake. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing my screen here and showing you some slides on 
uh, the energy performance contract. And I just wanted to say uh, Jeff Day, uh, who's also working with us, wanted to be here, but he's actually on a family vacation right now. So he says his he sends his um, hellos and wishes he could be here, but um, he's somewhere warmer than we are, unfortunately. Um, so let me uh, I'm going to share my screen now and let me know if you can see it uh, through a thumbs up if that's all right. All right. Can you see this this PowerPoint right here? All good. Yes. OK, yep. perfect. So this is um, we just wanted to give the board an update on the energy performance contract that we're uh, doing here in uh, for the building. So we'll kind of just give you a brief update. Uh, the four buildings like we uh, were talking about were Myers Middle School, Albany School of Humanities, Hackett Middle School and Arbor Hill Elementary School. And we're looking at a potential project size of roughly ten million dollars. And uh, that that is the project size based on the uh, ever increasing utility rates that we're seeing um, around here. And we're looking at about 30 percent energy savings. And the important thing is that this is guaranteed zero cost impact to the district over the lifetime of the project. So the energy savings and the state aid will uh, fund the, in, the project in its entirety uh, throughout the 18 year life cycle of this project. So. Um, I'm going to go into some more detailed financial highlights, and I'm going to kind of pass it over to Andrew at this point um, to go through. And Andrew, uh, just let me know when you want to go to the next slide. We're going to talk about the different ways to finance. Well, though, so with an EPC project like this, there's basically two financing options. The first one would be uh, what we would call a serial bond financing. Um, this would count towards the district's debt limit and for that reason um, would require a super majority vote of that 60%. Um, the financing would be done with bond anticipation notes if needed and then permanent financing for serial bonds. Both of those would be done through a competitive bidding process to ensure the lowest interest rate. Um, the repayment would be over 16 years to closely align with the building aid that would be received for the project. Energy savings over the 18 year window would allow for uh, the final two years of the project to be a net gain. Josh, if you don't mind going to the next slide. And then the other option would be through a, um, the ratio change around 88%. With a lease, this doesn't go uh, count towards the district's debt limit. For that reason, you would not require the supermajority, just the majority 50%. Leases generally carry a little bit higher interest rate, so there would be a, a little bit higher interest expense expected with a lease financing. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, the impact of the project size doesn't uh, uh, decrease the project size, just increases your interest expense a touch. Um, and then the last two bullets are the same as with a bond financing. We would finance it over 16 years to align and with the building aid. And then again, the final two years would be a net gain to the. Thank you, Andrew. So and in going into that, uh, to working towards the vote, um, we at Day can provide some support through um, a marketing campaign. And one of those things is um, some mailers, flyers and um, videos. And so I'd like to kind of show you an example of a video uh, here that we've done for another district to kind of show you what um, you can be looking forward to us creating with uh, you folks here. Hello, hello, my name is Patrick Turner, and as the superintendent of Lisbon Central School, I welcome you to enjoy a short informational video regarding our initiative to provide clean and energy efficient improvements for our educational campus. Hi, this is Jeff Day. I'd like to thank the entire community for all your help and cooperation to keep school open this year. I'd like to take this moment to talk to you about something very exciting that's happening in the district. In the midst of all the activities surrounding the current school year, the district has not lost focus on their responsibility to be both fiscally responsible and environmentally conscious to the Lisbon community. Lisbon Central School District is eligible for funding aid to help meet their goals, and you can help. I'll explain how. With each capital project, we challenge ourselves to find the best ways to enhance the educational experience. As I'm sure you're aware, the community approved an upcoming capital renovation project, which will improve the buildings and help to better the student learning experience for years to come. 
At the same time, the district looks to introduce updated energy efficient heating and cooling systems, as well as LED lighting that's much better for the environment and reduces energy costs so more of your tax dollars can be spent on the students and their experience at school. The Lisbon Central School District and the school board have agreed to use an energy performance contract to meet their goals. Now, an energy performance contract, or EPC for short, is a project funding mechanism used by many of the schools in New York State. And here's how it works. The district has utility bills, just like you and I do. An EPC helps the district to purchase energy efficient equipment, like LED lighting, better heating and cooling equipment, and make other system improvements that save energy. Engineers calculate just how much we will be saving over an 18 year period. The New York State Education Department then certifies all these findings. There's no risk to the district since these savings are guaranteed by the EPC contractor. The district then gets the money that we'll be saving over that 18 year period right now. That money will be used to purchase the high efficiency lighting and energy efficient HVAC equipment the district needs. The entire EPC is funded in part by New York State. The district is reimbursed at 90% of their school age ratio. The district can receive 100% of their aid if the public votes yes on this project. Remember, voter approval provides additional aid for this project. There is no impact on the tax levy and this initiative pays for itself. February 23rd from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. in the main lobby of the Lisbon Central School is your opportunity to vote on this energy performance contract. As we plan for our future, we are very excited to be partnering with Day Automation Systems. All right. So that's just kind of an example. And I think that does a good job of kind of explaining what an EPC is and then also kind of lets them know what that vote would be. So um, I'm going to go on to the actual project itself. I know we've presented this before, but just going to kind of do a brief overview again. Um, this primary, primarily we're focusing on mechanical and electrical upgrades in the district, including um, boiler replacements, chiller replacements, some domestic hot water heater replacements, uh, and then electrically transformers and some air handling units as well. And there's some unit ventilators in uh, the Albany School of Humanities that we're looking to upgrade as well. Um, then the next largest component is LED lighting. That's kind of the driver for all of this and the savings from that helps fund the lower payback items like the chiller or the boilers. Um, and then the building envelope improvements, that's just kind of keeping the building tight, uh, not letting any of the heat or, heating or cooling out that you're just now upgrading. And um, then we're looking into uh, solar as well on, um, we're looking right now on some of the new roofs at Arbor Hill actually. So, um, and then there's a, a small portion of energy controls that we're gonna, that are gonna be incorporated with some of these new units. Um, and that's kind of where this project looks right now for those four buildings. And then the, the next uh, part is uh, education support. And this is kind of something that it's kind of near and dear, at least to mine, and I know Steve as well. Um, so <clears throat> we um we we're looking to work with the school and we have we're trying to get a, a second meeting we have emails out to try to schedule something for in the next couple of weeks with Amanda and Sarah to uh, continue our discussions on how we can uh, use the work that we're doing to uh, help with st help students and uh, you know help to increase the STEM curriculum program and the big thing that we're trying to do is to make sure that everything's equitable and for for all the students, not just, you know, one of the schools and one of the grade levels. We really want to see how we can have the biggest impact and working with them and what they've already been doing um, has just been fantastic. And it's there's some we could spend a whole time talking about that. But um, <clears throat> excuse me, they uh, we're looking to see, like I said, how we can we can help and do everything we can to to leverage kind of all this great stuff that you're doing in the schools um, to help the students uh, even more. And then kind of the next steps. <clears throat> so today we're looking for uh, the approval for the seeker resolution. Uh, and then we're also looking for the proposition, the uh, approval for the proposition to vote um, to go to the voters in May. Uh, and then obviously in May 17th, we're looking to do that, um, that positive vote to get that additional. It's actually for here, it's about 14% additional aid. Uh, so it's rather substantial. And um, again, once we, We'll, we'll work with the district to help with that campaign to market this and um, try to get that 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 vote. Um, and then from a time timing perspective, 
this is kind of how we we envision this uh, phase one analysis. Uh, obviously, we're we're kind of at the March point right now, right in the middle um, for the uh, proper the the proper seeker vote, and then in May would be the referendum vote, and our goal would be to submit to state ed in the fall and hopefully begin um, you know the actual work to install some of these energy conservation measures in the winter slash spring of uh, 2023. And um, that's just for the, those first four buildings. We're also um, going to be looking in other buildings, uh, hopefully this summer slash you know, fall winter timeframe. We're going to work with the district, the building condition surveys that, that were done, as well as work with um, BPI and the other um, people in the district to find out you know, what other buildings could be in this next phase to see how we can get the entire district onto um, more energy, more, being more energy efficient and have better um, HVAC um, infrastructure. So that's kind of where we're looking at right now at this this snapshot in time. And um, if you have any questions, please let us know and I'll open it up. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. For those who are listening at home or in the room, we also had this similar but slightly more detailed presentation at our last full board meeting two weeks ago. So there's more information there. <clears throat> our policy and procedures that we always discuss something at one meeting and don't act on it till the following meeting in case we have the opportunity for public comment in between. With that introduction, board colleagues, does anyone have any additional questions for the presenters? I have one and I'm wondering, I don't know if this is for Deputy Superintendent Roaring or um, one of the gentlemen, I just wanna understand the exact language that's gonna be on the referendum and how that works vis-a-vis um, -vis our debt limit ceiling. And because I know to do the bonding, we need to have 60% uh, vote, but to do the lease, we'd only need 50%, if I understand correctly. So so does that mean we have a single referendum and it just depends if it passes 60 or more, then we have both options open to us, but if it passes 50 to 60, we can only lease? Is that is that correct? Is that how it actually is structured? Yes, that's yes, that's true. true. Yeah, if you uh, are going out for the 60% the majority and don't achieve the 60% majority, you are still able to finance it through the lease. Yes. Okay. And does it matter whether we get the 50% or it doesn't matter? It's just... You, it still has to be approved. Yeah, you still have to get the 50%. It just, you wouldn't require the 60% to, to do the lease financing. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon my cough. I understand. Um, other questions? Okay, so we have a number of resolutions before us. You'll see in the action section of this agenda item, there are four resolutions. We do not have to read these verbatim, which is good because this meeting will be long enough, even without the reading of the entire uh, resolutions. But I will entertain a motion to adopt these four resolutions that are before you on um, item H2. Board Member Wilson, second by Board Member Krejci. All in favor? Uh, that is unanimous. Thank you very much. So we now move on to the feeder alignment committee and I turn the microphone to Superintendent Adams. Good evening again and uh, we will go through our presentation. We will do an abbreviated version of the background. Uh, just so that we can make sure that we are all on the same page and then we will go through the presentation just for consistency to make sure that everyone is up to speed. Um, with regard to our background tonight, our agenda, we're going to follow what is listed and this has been the same agenda that we've had several times, so I won't read each item, but I'll go ahead and start with um, starting back in 2001 with the facilities referendum where the foundation was laid for rebuilding our and renovating our elementary and middle schools in the district. In 2009, Livingston Middle School closed and a reconfiguration committee was established to begin the development of a new feeder pattern. In 2015-16, this set the stage for the grade configuration model of all sixth graders attending middle school because at the time, sixth graders were um, partially in elementary schools and in middle schools. In addition, Brighter Choice closed and presented an urgent short-term facility solution whereby temporary, a temporary feeder pattern was planned for the next three to five years. 
In 2016-17, the phase two committee reviewed the options of a fourth middle school or a third larger middle school. With that, the voters approved a facilities project in January of 2017, and O'Neill opened in the fall of 2017-2018 to be a temporary location to accommodate the influx of students. In September of 2017, the district looked to achieve balance among schools and an equitable enrollment structure, which would be the least disruptive. The BOE made the decision to have three 650 seat middle schools and North Albany was selected as the third middle school. In May of 2019, voters approved a facilities project to expand and renovate North Albany in order to serve 650 students with facilities aligned with Hackett and Myers. And we do have the highlights, which are listed on the slide, and some of those enhancements that were made to North Albany Elementary School, now North Albany Middle School. <coughs> Excuse me. So the current committee overview in looking at the feeder alignment committee, which started meeting in July of 2021. The committee was formed to engage community members and district personnel in a partnership to develop criteria so that a recommendation could be made to the board uh, for an equitable feeder pattern for all students. And that would be for students transitioning from elementary to middle school. The committee began the work last summer um, with one representative from each school. Five members carried the work forward through the fall. And then we added a layer with an ad hoc committee for with three board members and then joined in December, which joined in December, along with our statistician, statistician, Dr. Robin. So the parents included on that committee were Dorian Salat, William Lemon, Daniel Katz, Talia Harrell, and Marina Marku O'Malley. Our board members, President Ann Savage, Secretary Dr. Shradar Shatur, and member Hassan Aminyawe. The overall goal, uh, all three middle schools would be roughly the same size. All three middle schools would have students with similar needs so that the resources could be um, allocated appropriately. Uh, looking at continuing the feed of elementary schools to middle schools to allow student relationships to continue. The timeline would be that the implementation of the new feeder pattern would start in the 22-23 school year for sixth grade only and add a new sixth grade cohort each year until the pattern is fully implemented by the 24-25 school year. And the students that are currently in grades six through seven would remain in place until they moved on to high school. So the enrollment pattern considerations looked at balancing the total enrollment for each building, balancing the resources to meet the needs of the students, looking at academics, attendance, discipline, et cetera. And the et cetera would include social, emotional, mental health concerns. So I want to make sure that that's clear. Number of school changes from the current feeder pattern and then transportation factors. So factors that were considered in projecting the enrollment of the schools, we looked at the current students in grades three through five, large number of new students entering the school district at sixth grade. What would that return and new entrant be for our self-contained special education students. Also looking at the students in the continuous enrollment of students from elementary to middle school. How many students are we retaining? Not meaning holding back in terms of progressing through education, but how many students are continuing their enrollment uh, from elementary to middle? That was really information that was um, very important because we looked at the data and 81.8% of our non self-contained students transitioned and stayed with us from elementary to middle, while 84.8% of our self-contained students stayed with us from elementary to middle school. And then we looked at the dual language program and for the first year it would be one deep and for the next years it would be two deep and that way we would have the space to grow that particular program. The metrics that we used looked at academics, attendance, discipline, and a risk score uh, for returning students. Um, we looked at weighting those components. The new entrant, we calculated a new entrant sixth grade performance as a percentage and used that uh, to create a, a comparable composite score. With regard to the number of scenarios that we would be able to examine, 
uh, through this process, uh, we were able to have over 500,000 possible scenarios. And through discussion, and you can listen to those board meetings and hear that process, we were able to drop down from 500,000 to 318, and then down to 60. And then the conversation that modified the 60 potential scenarios going down to the eight scenarios is at the February 10th meeting. For community engagement, um, online community survey, we had an initial survey and we had 448 respondents. We held 23 meetings since August and 16 since the start of January. Virtual meetings at all 12 of our elementary schools uh, during the week of February 14th through 17th. And in-person community meetings that were open to all, those were on February 28th, March 1st, and March 16th. We have a frequently asked questions posting um, through our communications division with, and it is located at albanyschools.org slash communications slash feeder FAQ. Our second online community survey, uh, we had 817 respondents. We did translate the information into a number of languages and the videos of each of the feeder alignment committee meetings are available at albanyschools.org slash committee. From the community feedback, a couple of things that we were that we received questions about, the main topics about honors classes. Honors classes are offered at each of our middle schools. We have worked to um, have consistency among our middle schools, not just for the horizontal alignment, but looking at that vertical alignment, knowing that all of our students will end up at Albany High because we have one high school. So trying to ensure that that level of consistency is there within the instructional program with our honors classes uh, was very important. Sibling preference, based on our numbers, the district should be able to accommodate sibling preference. Open enrollment, we have a process in place which is based on space availability and the needs of our students. Facility readiness came up because we do know that North Albany is a construction site as well as operating school. And so we are looking um, at the results and we are seeing, and you'll hear that in the presentation a little bit later with regard to the capital project, uh, North Albany is on target. We are looking to be ready in the fall. And then the only component that is left is the theater, which will open next summer. Um, just as a thought with regard to that, our high school has been under construction. Our theater um, has been offline uh, for a few years at the high school and it will be coming back up soon. So if we needed to use a theater, we could always use the high school or we could use you know, other schools or other venues. And so we, we look to that uh, completion, especially with our classroom settings this coming fall. And then we had concerns about transportation. And for that particular piece, I will turn it over to Mr. Lesko. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk for a bit about uh, transportation considerations, uh, and then uh, I'll also review the final survey data of it uh, from the survey that closed last Friday afternoon. Um, I'm going to start with a review of where we are currently with our middle school transportation for uh, for the three schools, we operate 13 uh, tripper buses with CDTA uh, to serve the three schools. Three uh, serve Hackett Middle School and five each serve Myers and uh, North Albany Middle School. The scheduled ride times for those uh, those 13 buses range from 40, 14 to 42 minutes. Uh, six of those 13 uh, buses are scheduled for uh, 30 minutes or less. Uh, the, there is um, uh, only one route is scheduled over 36 minutes and nearly every student on that bus uh, is uh, has a scheduled ride time of uh, 28 minutes or less. There are days when the rides are longer than the scheduled ride time, but by five to seven minutes or so, depending upon road conditions or traffic conditions uh, along the way. And all eligible students uh, this year and every year have f uh, full free access to the CDTA route network uh, all day long. Our, our planning for next year will be, will uh, take the shape of the planning that we have uh, every year. Uh, obviously, there will be a new feeder pattern, a new feeder pattern to consider. But we, we begin by taking into account who are the students who are going to be going to school at each building in a given school year. And as soon as as soon as the Board of Education has made a decision about uh, the new feeder pattern, we will begin to look at who those students are, where they will be attending school, 
and how we would best serve them uh, from a transportation perspective in partnership with CDTA next school year. Um, as you know, uh, we've uh, our transportation budget proposal for next year includes funding for up to six additional uh, CDTA tripper routes uh, at a total uh, a total budget request of $270,000. Uh, we uh, we receive 79% reimbursement for our transportation services from uh, from the state on an annual basis. So the total cost to the district for those six uh, those six additional tripper buses would be $56,700. A few additional factors um, we will be transporting roughly the same number of students to our middle schools next year, no matter which of the uh, of the current patterns under consideration uh, is selected. Um, buses for uh, the middle schools will continue to serve uh, every part of our community. Our goal will continue to be a walk of 0 0.5 mile, a half a mile or less uh, to a trip or bus stop. It's not something we're always able to achieve. We are mostly able to achieve it and we'll continue to try and do that and do it in as many cases as possible, particularly particularly through the addition of uh, additional routes. Um, we will ensure that ride times remain consistent with our current schedules and, and do our very best to shorten those rides uh, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, we had talked about this last week and we've continued to have conversations with CDTA about, about the idea of uh, using the highways that uh, that's loop around the city uh, uh, for some of our tripper routes to, to make them more efficient and, and timely. We've decided not to do that for uh, for safety reasons. We don't think that would be uh, the best way for us to, to transport our students on CDTA buses. So we would continue to use uh, use city streets to do that. And just as, as one example, we currently have a bus from North Albany that serves the, um, as an example, the Eagle Hill and Point of Woods neighborhood. And that's that's the bus that I refer to. It has a total ride time of 42 minutes, and it does make it makes the uh, it makes the, the trip uh, from North Albany Middle School to um, uh, the Homestead Avenue, which is right before uh, the U Albany entrance on Western Avenue, in, in uh, 28 minutes. So it's it's that it's in line with the other tripper buses that we have citywide, with the exception of that last spur when it has to make the trip out to Point Woods. And uh, CDT, we've asked CDT to evaluate the entire secondary network, including uh, including the high school trooper routes, to see where we might be able to make some efficiencies and to make sure that we're maximizing the the, the use of the of all the tripper buses that serve our secondary students in the best possible way. As uh, the superintendent noted, we ended up with 817 total respondents to the survey, which uh, closed last Friday. Uh, when we met last uh, on Thursday evening last week, we had 617 total respondents as of 5 p.m. that day. So in the final 24 hours uh, of the survey, we received another 200 respondents, which, which was terrific. It was uh, it was great to see that level of response from uh, from our community uh, to, uh, to the survey. Um, in, in the five criteria that we asked our community members to uh, to prioritize. Academic equity uh, was by far the leading, uh, the leading criteria for the folks who responded to the survey, with two thirds or 67% of the respondents indicating that that was very important to them in thinking about this decision. Total enrollment turned out to be the least, uh, least important of the five criteria that we that we asked for feedback on, with 34% of the respondents uh, indicating that that was very important to them. Minimizing long walks, those walks that are the range of one to 1.49 miles just before you become eligible for bus transportation at 1.5 miles. Uh, just a little bit over half of the respondents, 52%, indicated that that was a very important uh, factor for them. Maximizing bus eligibility, maximizing the number of students who, who live 1.5 miles or more from school. Uh, was 41% uh, uh, of the people indicated that that was uh, that was important to them. And then among the, 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 the five criteria of minimizing changes from the current feeder pattern was right about at half of the respondents, 49% of the respondents indicated that that was an important factor for them. The, the, the fits well uh, uh, feedback on this on the uh, eight scenarios all range from uh, in the end 28% to 32%. So they were all uh, relatively tightly grouped. There were three scenarios in which, and uh, in, in, uh, you'll see that on the, the last slide. There were three scenarios in which respondents indicate more respondents indicated that a certain scenario fit well uh, with their priorities uh, than fit poorly. Uh, 
scenario 25828A had 32% of the respondents indicating that it fit well for them. Scenario 25828B had 28% of the respondents district-wide indicating that it fit well. 26225A had 30% of the respondents indicating that it fit well for them. 60348B had 32% uh, as well of the uh, respondents who said it fit well for them. 67759B had 28% of the respondents indicating that that scenario fit well for them. 67759C had 29% of the respondents indicating that it fit well for them. 76882A was at 29% as well. And 77107A was at 30% of the respondents indicating that it fit well for, for and on the last, uh, the last survey slide, you can see that how they all um, ended up in terms of fits well and fits poorly, the, uh, the top and the bottom of the, of the choices. But the, the uh, scenarios highlighted in green and yellow are the three in which uh, more folks said it fit well for them than fit poorly. And uh, 77107A was, uh, was uh, a dead heat in those categories at 30% of reach. And I'll turn it back over to the superintendent. When we look at our next steps, um, pending the board's decision, we will begin working uh, with CDTA immediately so that we can review and look at the um, building of the trippers. But we do know that that is also um, based on the budget vote as well, because we have asked for six additional, the funding for six additional tripper buses. Um, evaluating the plan with staffing needs in each of the buildings, which is the appropriate time that we would be doing that. Um, scheduling spring orientation programs for students and families. Uh, that would be starting um, later this spring, um, right around the same time that we would do them anyway, which is typically a little bit after spring break. And then uh, scheduling summer transition camps for new students at each of the middle schools, which usually takes place in August. So those things are still on schedule. Schools um, have the you know framework and the organization of because they've done it before. And now that we are able to do it in person, it's going back to something that's familiar. And so um, those those programs are, you know, in, in theory and in practice in place. And it would be the, one of the things that we would be able to do to retor return back to some sense of normalcy. So at this time, I'll open it up for questions. So. <clears throat> Sorry, those of you who were there last night know that I was really coughing last night. So you can see my cold is progressing and I'm almost done. Um, so you want to do questions on this and then we'll do the uh, facility presentation and then we'll do questions on that. Is that what you want to do? That sounds perfect to me. Board colleagues, I know we have seen this presentation many, many times. There's some minor new things or various changes. Does anybody have any questions for the superintendent about the presentation? We're not going to talk about choices yet. We're just about the presentation. Anyone? Comment is fine too. Board Member Wilson. Thank you. So, um, and like you indicated, I won't talk about the choices, but I do feel it's incumbent to state that we did approve an equity policy, and thus, by that virtue, we are responsible for its implementation. And I do feel like, I, you know, just to highlight, there are some indicators of equity. Three of them are ensuring just outcomes, raising marginalized voices and challenging imbalances of power and privilege. And there was a parent who was so kind to share um, a document that had 11 indicators, which I could not access, or, but I did find 16. Of the 16, there are nine that are related to access to opportunities and resources. And the three I wanna highlight are an indicator of disparity is disparity in students' exposure to racial, ethnic, and economic segregation. Um, 11 was disparities in access to an, access to and enrollment in a rigorous coursework indicator, and 16 was disparities in non-academic supports for student success. So like with that being said, I do want to just highlight that there are, of course, and I won't talk about the choices, I feel like everyone's choices sort of highlighted the, the indicators in the composite scores that led towards equity was, with very little variation. So I just felt like that was incumbent for us to mention. 
Thank you very much. Other comments or questions on the presentation? Um, one thing I just wanted to mention that came up in the public comment that I thought was a was a good idea that maybe you can start thinking about how you'll work in is individual meetings at elementary schools since roughly half of our elementary schools are going to be changing um, next year. You know, those those schools are going to feel very differently impacted than a school that's continuing. So having going to them, bringing the principal maybe to them so that and some of the key teachers or whatever, however we can do that to make them, you know, to start orienting them to the staff and the uh, program on their in their own home school, I think would be a very uh, gracious way to start orienting them. Other and we will have plenty of time to talk about all next steps. We don't need to solve this problem tonight, but it was just something on my mind. Anything else before we move on to the um, capital project update for North Albany so that we can get fully assessed on that? OK, whenever you're ready to move on. So at this time, uh, I will turn it over to Deputy Superintendent Roaring again for our capital project update. I think it's important to note this is where the information um, with regard to North Albany's uh, facilities will be explained. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Adams. With me this evening, I have two representatives from Turner Construction, uh, Bill Steele and John Hunt, as well as Rich Peckham, who's the architect from CS Nurch on this project. Um, we're pleased to be able to provide an update this evening on where the progress of the construction stands. It's been about 10 months since we were able to get in and start work, and they will provide very clear details on where we are and where we're headed over the next five months. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, to get started off, Area E, this is one of the first completed areas turned over, occupied over the uh, holiday uh, recess. Uh, we have a work to complete list. These are items that uh, were either delayed due to scope change, uh, material delays, uh, uh, and other things. Um, so just going through them, you know, room signage, uh some door hardware for the toilet room uh, that was a change uh, in the scope uh just some damage to an existing bct floor tile uh some case casement window installation uh, which was a material delay uh a corridor storefront uh, and some doors uh separating this space uh, exterior egress door uh, a couple of whiteboards um some permanent signage um, waiting on the window replacement, uh, additional lobby floor discoloration just from some of the temporary provisions, uh, and some ca metal casework, which was actually installed, but there was some damage. Uh, it's not really noticeable now, but the contractor is going to be replacing. Uh, as far as B3A, this is the second floor in the 1952 wing. Uh, over the most recent break, uh, the contractor was able to install the lockers, which were uh, delayed uh, due to material shortages. Uh, over that break, they also completed the unit ventilator replacement uh, to these existing UVs. Uh, that was an additional scope item. And these are in all of the classrooms getting new units. Um, along with that, uh, just some additional work to complete, room signage, uh, a couple of whiteboards. Um, that wraps it up for this corridor classrooms. Uh, an update for the cafeteria kitchen and serving, uh, you know, progress is steadily uh, moving along. Uh, most recently completed is the floor and wall tiles, exterior windows, uh, interior finishes, drywall, paint, uh, ongoing currently uh, installing light fixtures, closing up the ceilings. Uh, there is a material delay in this area with a walk-in cooler. Uh, this is the only kitchen equipment item it's space item in the space that is currently delayed. It wouldn't have an impact on the move in uh, to this space. Uh, and I believe so the move into this space is going to be um, end of April and that cooler is going to be showing up uh, in middle of May. Uh, looking at the general neutral locker room, uh, this uh, locker room was completed at all but the lockers that have showed up uh, over the winter break uh, so just a little more work to finish up the fillers um, and seal the gaps on these lockers uh, other than that it's great for occupancy 
of the Albany Public Library space. So this would say is about 90% done. Uh, there was a change in scope regarding the storefront entrance, um, mostly just to separate uh, the school entrance from the library. Uh, so there's a extremely long lead time on these aluminum storefronts we're seeing. So over the most recent uh, winter break, uh, the contractor was actually able to install a temporary door, uh, which looks just like the finished door, uh, with the exception of uh, some thermal break in the material. Um, so that's completed and they're just final um, closing up a closet wall uh, that will complete the separation from the school to this library space. As far as the classroom addition goes, uh, most recently completed is the steel mainframe uh, installation of the deck. Uh, they're wrapping up all the roof decking uh, and starting the exterior wall framing. Uh, the auditorium addition uh, with the warmer weather most recently uh, they've actually started back up continuing uh, the final piece to the foundations um, more upcoming work is going to be steel erection starting uh, in the next month or so so area a uh, we're doing work on the first floor in a classroom and work in the third floor uh, in a bank of two classrooms and some offices uh, so most recently completed MEP rough-ins, uh, drywall taping, upcoming uh, in progress is the first floor. Uh, so there is um, some cracking that was uh, unforeseen condition in that floor. Uh, the contractor has been approved to proceed on repairing these cracks. Uh, on the third floor, some of the challenges, uh, there was some slab elevation discrepancies between two rooms. Uh, so work had to be completed to level out the floors to maintain a, a level uh, height. Uh, additionally, uh, there was some uh, walls in worse conditions uh, than others that required some additional patch um, on those areas. Looking at now the third floor area B, um, which is the rear uh, building, uh, Throughout the month with uh, demolition has been completed, MEP rough-ins uh, and drywall installation. Uh, upcoming work in progress is the final installation of the sprinkler, uh, completing wall taping uh, and starting to prime the walls. Uh, some of the challenges in these areas is that uh, due to the existing plaster ceilings, there were some uh, items that were uncovered that were asbestos containing, such as a pipe installation on some of the existing storm drain piping. Uh, that was able to be abated over um, some of the most recent breaks. Uh, additionally, uh, there was the existing conditions of these walls because it is older plastic. Uh, some of the paints delaminating requires some additional framing uh, to give it a good, clean, uh, finished look. Um, so to date, uh, some of the most sizable changes uh, from the last time we've met is a uh, change order regarding uh, insulation. So with the material uh, in the market they are, there is um, material shortages. Uh, the contractor was unable to procure uh, some of the insulation they needed for uh, the class and the auditorium. Uh, in waiting for this material, it would delay the roof install to start in June of this summer. Uh, so they've actually uh, were able to find an alternate insulation material, which has uh, all equal properties. We can maintain the roof warranty. Um, and that was approved for around $30,000. Uh, so that pushed the insulation of the roof for the classroom addition from a potential of June install to April. Uh, so we were able to complete the work, um, and turn over the space by the end of the summer. Another uh, larger unforeseen um, resulting in a change order was some CMU wall removals. Uh, the original contract document showed um, a lot of these walls as gyp or stud framing uh, and uncovering some furred walls. Uh, it was a CMU that was encountered, uh, which was pretty extensive for the removals. Uh, with the third floor abatement, um, there was the uncovered mastic tack boards in addition to the insulation. Um, we originally held uh, an allowance of $80,000 for this uh, over the breaks when these items were completed. 
Uh, we use a TNM model basis for pricing, and we were able to get this price down to forty thousand dollars for the first um, abatement of the mastic in all of the classrooms, and then fourteen thousand and nine thousand respectively for additional uncovered mastic and the insulation. So today we've approved thirty six. Uh, 36 change orders for $350,000, uh, still tracking open change orders or potential change orders for around $339,000. Uh, a number of these are in review with the architect uh, just to verify the final pricing. Um, TCCO, that's Turner Construction, is currently reviewing around 28. Um, this is just final back and forth with the contractor, uh, finalizing pricing and backup information. Uh, and 40 of them are still waiting for pricing from the contractor. The starting contingency for this project was 1.4. Uh, currently, with the approved changes and the total open changes, the balance is 793, uh, about 53% remaining. And this, based on the remaining construction volume, is around 7%. Thank you very much for that very detailed presentation. Uh, board colleagues, I don't know how many questions we'll have on this, but as our usual, as is our usual practice, I'm going to ask you to prioritize your questions and ask one question at a time. If everybody gets a first question, we'll certainly go around again. Who has a question on North Albany facilities? Board Member Al Mignawi. Thank you. Um, so very simple question um, in terms of what will be remaining uh, at the start of next school year? What is going to be remaining to be done in terms of projects, uh, construction projects? So I can I can take that question. Um, Board member Almanyoy, what will be left next year when we start the school year in September will be the construction of the auditorium. This was indicated the foundations are underway but that is scheduled to be completed uh, summer of 23. All of the other spaces for the facility will be completed. Thank you. Board Member Wilson. Thank you, and um, not so much a question, but just to tie the loop because um, myself, um, Board Member Emily Yowie and Board Member Smith are on facilities and we get the pleasure of um, getting the status update. And when we see change orders, we not only um, interrogate them because of our fiduciary responsibilities, but because way back when, when this referendum came up, it did pass overwhelmingly in the community. And their major charge to us that if, if we were going to do this is that the school had to be equitable. And the capacity to do so came out of the fact, of course, that the Y vacated and we were able to make a similar size and scope school. So thank you so much. And I know people may hear, oh, well, you know, material delays, but I, I don't know if you mentioned or highlighted Part of what we question when you say material delays, not only in terms of cost, are you are also making equivalent substitutions. So we are, as far as our understanding on the facilities committees, not only on task to start with our rollout of sixth grade for whomever goes, but just in terms of we're just on task period to be ready for September. So just wanted to highlight that. Anyone else? I just have one question for Mr. Hunt, which is along the same line. First of all, I very much like the contingency numbers. That was a lovely thing to see. 53% contingency with 7% volume left. That is a very nice place to be. So we uh, thank you for, for the tight management that has gotten us here. Um, but then I wanted to basically follow up on what Ms. Wilson was just asking and ask you, given the number of supply chain issues that you mentioned that have been ongoing as you've been working, what's your level of confidence that you're going to be able to deliver uh, what Ms. Roaring has just described, which is all products, all completion, in time for the very first day of school next year, which will be essentially Labor Day. Yeah, I'd say we we have a pretty high confidence uh, in the contractors uh, to complete the work this summer. You know, we're rolling out a number of different um, controls to monitor what's left in regards to materials, uh, what has been procured. You know, pushing the contractor to get all of the remaining available materials. Uh, either on site, somehow in storage into Connex boxes or into the warehouses. Uh, in regards to uh, trying to stay on top of ahead of the work, um, you know, a lot of pull plan scheduling sessions, which, you know, basically holds the contractor accountable to dates they give us. Um, 
and just a, a lot of other systems like that to keep everything on target. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I have one last quick follow up, which is very small. Uh, having been in North Albany building a number of times, it's really quite an amazing and interesting building. And I think if I recall correctly that they, they have a cafetorium kind of stage set up. Is that remaining when all is said and done? So that would be in place next year or no, that will not be in existence as I recall it. I just don't remember what's happening to that space. Yeah, so that space actually turns into the new media center. Uh, and this stage will actually be modified with uh, a nice glass rail. There's actually a handicap or an ADA elevator to allow students up there. And then that will be a separate sort of uh, computer area inside the media center. Ah, I understand. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Speaking of media centers, I just am very excited that once again, we will have a Albany Public Library have co-located co with one of our schools, which we used to have many years ago, but have not had for some time. So it will be lovely to see those partnerships flowering again at that building. Um, anybody else on that? Any other questions for our friends? Otherwise, they'll be back with the rest of the capital project update in a little bit because we still need to hear about Albany High and the um, five-year facilities projects. Okay, so now we're going to do exactly the same as we did last time. Um, which is um, go back to our more formal structure where we ask people to give a short statement about their thoughts um, in particular around their scenario selections. Um, you can say whatever you want to say, but recall that our goal here is to come down to a single scenario that we can all live with. So Mr. Almanyoui, you have the first opportunity and welcome to being in person to do this. Pre President Savage, do we have are we going to do three minutes a piece or four minutes a piece? My intention was to allow people to go with short statements and expect everybody to be respectful of each other's time. What do you think? Can we do that or we need to time? I'm happy to time if you guys want to. No. All right. Thanks. The general consensus seems to me we will be respectful of each other's time. Go ahead, Mr. Almanelli. Thank you, colleagues, and uh, thank you to superintendent, the cabinet, and uh, everyone that's been involved in this process from the feeder committee uh, to Dr. Robin and all of our public uh, uh, participation and comments. It's been, it's actually been really good to see everybody coming out. Uh, so first, I just wanted to kind of reiterate that what we have right now is an unsustainable temporary feeder pattern. It is uh, unsustainable because it's extremely unbalanced. Uh, we have two middle schools that are ex have a very high population in the 700 uh, students per, per school, and then we have one that is somewhere around 300. Uh, that is really something that we're going to have to resolve this year. Personally speaking, I don't think we can put this off. I've tried to do mental gymnastics about how we can pull, pull this off, but I just don't think we can. We have a North Albany Middle School that is going to be 97% complete or whatever you'd like to put it, and we need to utilize that building fully. Otherwise, we're really not being good stewards for our taxpayers. Um, so I'm resolved on deciding something tonight. I do have a favorite, and I've kind of come to a uh, process of elimination with my favorite. And really, I started that process by understanding that these eight scenarios that were given to us uh, were, it's, it's not magic, it was data crunching. Um, if you don't understand it, I understand you don't understand it. It's very complex. However, there's math, scientific research, and I have to trust that a statistician with a doctorate knows what he's doing, as well as um, Anne and uh, anyone that was involved in creating these uh, data sets. So with that said, I'm looking at eight of these scenarios as being, as I was told uh, by Dr. Robin, as we were all told, um, very, very equal and that we shouldn't really nitpick the differences in the composite score um, and that they are 
as equal as you're going to get. And you know, these are the top, you know, top few percentages of plausible uh, options. So with that said, I really wanted to consider things of um, going into that thinking that these are all equal options. I wanted to consider things of really transportation and convenience. So um, I did some basic research on distances from North Albany, and there was just very uh, clearly one elementary school that would have had to deal with what I feel like an unreasonable burden of uh, transportation and inconvenience, which was New Scotland. Uh, they are the furthest, according to Google, uh, on a Monday morning or a, you know any morning, 7.30 a.m. It's going to take you seven, almost eight miles, 7.7 .7 miles, and at least 15 minutes. That was the minimum to drive your student to uh, North Albany, if that is uh, how you decide to get your child there. The the next closest was five minutes shorter and uh, a mile and a half less. So that resulted in me really not wanting to send New Scotland to North Albany. I mean, just as a person who lives in the city, I already think morning traffic is bad. This would just you're you're sending one of the largest population schools across uh, almost eight miles and you're just creating a lot more traffic. So I was able to remove New Scotland from that equation and it really brought it down to three options. Those three options are 67759C, 25828B, and 60348B. Now, I just wanted to again this process of elimination so i have three options in front of me and two of those options have quite balanced school layouts so i think it was four four and four um the the last one that i mentioned 60348b had a three four five situation and i didn't know how really to feel about that but ultimately i didn't like that arrangement because I feel like you're having five elementary schools feed into Hackett and a lot of the time teachers need to be in uh, consultation with the elementary schools and you're basically having five different connections for Hackett whereas North Albany has four and then uh, Myers would have three so I didn't like that option uh, based on it's just inconsistent. Uh, you don't know if if uh, enrollment will go up or down at these places. So it could it could ultimately imbalance it in the future. So I wanted to take that out, and that really left me with those two options of six seven seven five nine C and two five eight two B. And what I really wanted to look at again was the transportation factor, and when I did. There, there are a few things, if you give me one second, I apologize, that I did like about 67759C over uh, 25828B, and uh, it involves both transportation reasons as well as our family's personal choices. Um, I know that 67759C was overall the most most liked or um, well fit scenario and even even after um, we just looked at so with all the votes it was the top scenario when we just looked at the elementary votes it was the top scenario and when we looked at kind of leveling out the number of votes per school it it dropped but i believe that was only because we removed 
everything else other than the elementary votes. So I think if we included all the other votes in and it averaged out to 15%, I think it would be higher than number three in that situation. Regardless, um, I don't want to I don't want to overly belabor the point, but uh, the number of on the transportation end, the number of students uh, uh, over 1.5, which would basically require uh, busing, was on the low end for six, uh, seven, seven, five, nine C at a thousand and six, whereas. 2582B was 1,043. I know we are already thinking that you know, transportation is always complicated and it's been more complicated with COVID and you know low staffing and stuff. So I really think if we can get less long uh, uh, over 1.5 miles, it's kind of where I would like to be. So I, I'm leaning, I'm still leaning towards six, seven, seven, five, nine, six, and that's where I'm at. I'm going to yield my time. Thank you very much. Board Member Mann. Okay. So, you know, I looked at all of the um, uh, scenarios that were uh, put out and recommended, and I was pretty clear last week I think I'm coming I know that I'm coming from the same place this week um, as to uh, the scenarios that I um, uh, prefer um, and so my number one scenario is 25828 B and the reason that that is number one for me and let me just go to my little table here the reason why that's number one for me is because it balances our high achieving and lower achieving schools. And um, and as I shared last week, what we know is when you have that um, heterogeneous kind of community, those that are lower achieving tend to rise. And um, and that's a very uh, and that's very positive and it's good for our students. Um, I understand that the um, the it will be a commute for our uh, Eagle Point communities to uh, it will be a commute for our Eagle Point community to go to North Albany and at the same time it will continue to be a commute for our Arbor Hill community students to travel to Hackett and they've survived that and they've survived it well so we know that we can do that um, uh, the other reason why I liked 25828B um, is because our lower performing schools are spread out among um, uh, among the three different middle schools. And I think that's very important. So there's not a imbalance of resources. Um, so I think that's also quite positive. 25828B allows for the dual language program to remain at Hackett. And that allows for continuity of instruction, which is very positive. The enrollments in this scenario are balanced, and that's really important. And right now, as um, board uh, member Almanyawe um, shared, the enrollments are not balanced as it as they currently exist. So there is a need for um, for a change. And with this option, the enrollments are balanced. The transportation is comparable regarding the number of students that we serve, um, and that is also um, quite important. Um, and uh, factored into um, my decision to go with that as uh, uh, really my top scenario. If I had to pick another scenario, um, just for the sake of, just if I had to pick another scenario, I, I do want to go on the record, the other scenario I'd want to pick, um, and that is 67759C. Um, the concern that I have with this scenario is that um, there's not an even distribution of um, our high and lower performing schools. And what I mean by that is Giffen and Schuyler Achievement Academy are paired together, and that may lead to a slight imbalance of resources. Um, that would perhaps put it out of sync from the uh, other configuration that I that I cited, 25828B. Um, but um, that's and that's that's really what I 
That's really what I have. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Board Member Bay. Board Member Wilson, when you're ready. Thank you for not timing us because last time I was like out of breath, but I'm still going to put my timer on. So um, as far as the options, I would say two five, the first two are the same composite score. Um, 25828A has Arbor Hill going to North Albany, which is what they asked for. Um, there's two things about that, however. Dual going to North for me is awkward. If we have a dual program, we have to structurally support it and we are, you know, we've embedded that program, we've invested in that program heavily actually last year, and I think we have to structurally support it. In addition to, of course, wanting to go to North Albany, I do remember that discussion about Arbor Hill staying Arbor Hill and not becoming the middle school. And in another aspect of that discussion is that part of that walk, if you're walking to North Albany, is through an industrial zone, which is a child safety zone. Um, so that's that with that aspect of it. So that kind of more so eliminates 25828A and then leans me towards B. Um, I do hear families when they say Eagle Point and New Scotland is far from North Albany. Um, New Scotland, the school is centrally located within the city and Eagle Point is on the side closer to central. But regardless of all that, like you said, is far. And I want to um, highlight that for some North Albany students might be on the furthest reach of North Albany. So thus, if they're going to Arbor Hill, they may also be going to Hackett and thus be going very far. Similarly, for our South End students who may be in the Ezra Prentice or Mount Hope side of town, they're going to be, if they were going to be living there and thus going to North Albany, they're also going to be far. So very empathetic about the discussion about how far things are, and I'm definitely listening. And, um, and I remember someone indicated, well, some folks said they um, had decisions before the survey only because for me personally, we intimately spent time with this material. We did not, of course, talk about it, but we were just thinking, I'm me as a person who grew up here, very well course and well versed on how to navigate. My daughter gets dropped off near Eagle Point, so I have to get back downtown, you know, so I'm definitely cognizant of the navigation issues. So we're not minimizing them, we're empathetic with you about them. I wanna say um, also our current executive director at a village made a profound point that North Albany um, is easily becoming the new South End, and we have to consider that as well. Um, as far as you know, individuals who indicated, and I and one thing that struck me today, and maybe it was meant to be, when the young man said, um, you know, we're a good school, it's not what you think at TCCE. It made me a little teary-eyed because I thought about my coming up in Albany and things people used to say to me and the microaggressions, and people don't mean them that way, but they embed, you know, they impact you that way, and. Um, you know, when individual state don't move the students, move the resources, I, I understand what you mean and why you say that, but it's almost like an indication of separate but equal still. So we have to be cognizant of that too. And I understand, I hear people when they say they believe in equity, but don't change it yet. We have to remember that when we did Brown versus the Board of Education, there was a subtext called all deliberate speed. And with that, we did not do things quickly. It took, we still have segregation today thus. And um, I think another component of redlining, because we talked about that a little bit, there was a whole other part, which um, government agencies were involved in called racial covenants, which had nothing to do with your capacity or your income or your ability or your worthiness as a person. They just simply stated if you were non-white, you could not move to this part of town. And that's all over um, the United States and Albany too. Um, so much so that my grandmother had difficulty purchasing a home when she got to Albany in North Albany. It was not, a uh, predominantly black area. So um, another thing I consider too is um, we have been data driven for a very long time, several years, and that's how we've been moving the needle. And I do want a commu um, co uh, community advocate and Center for Law and Justice staff member Lauren Manning who said, I'm tired of moving needles, I wanna move boulders. I can assure you, <laughs> I can assure you I, um, you know, we are systemically, we are significantly, I, want, I think the thing about rushing, we're not rushing, we are significantly delayed. And so when you have an impression about North Albany or what's going on there, it's really rollover inequity because we have not addressed this yet to El Miyawi, the board member El Miyawi's point. So that's something to consider. And, you know, again, I, I wrote down when the student said, you may have a perception of the kids at TCE. Similarly, you may have a perception of North Albany, but Again, we're going to be making these changes and making these moves to 
move equity and move the needle or move boulders, if you will. So, um, like I stated, I felt like the choices we had, I leaned towards the highest composite score. Oh, why I made that point about being data driven and um, things of that nature is because there was overwhelming support in the community from the surveys about 60348B. And again, if we look at the composite score, it's the highest one, it's the worst one for inequity. So I realized that it sort of like placates people, the change isn't too sudden, it's not the change, you know, it's not a sudden change and it fits and it works and I understand and I appreciate that, but if we prolong inequity again, we'll be right back here again, not too, I just don't see how it's sustainable to entertain that one. It was in my top five initially and that's how it came to be eliminated at this time. Um, another, so 258, 28B, I'm leaning heavily towards like, because of all the components where like I stated, would love for Arbor Hill to go to North as they desire, but then there's that um, safety zone issue. And also where Arbor Hill goes, it goes to Hackett, Duhal also goes to Hackett, and we do have that investment that we're making. Um, seven, another high composite score, 768828A, which is 0.92, which is pretty much similar to 28A, the first one. It's, there's many aspects of it, I think, because of the composite score and because, like we stated, I understand certain schools move. Again, I'm not pleased with it totally because of North Albany aspect of dual and then, you know, us trying to reconfigure on that aspect of things. There's also the aspect of, um, there's this very minor differences with that one. And the final one that's like in my top three is the 69759C, which is one of the higher composite score. However, it's Arbor Hill going to hack it, Dual going to hack it again because of those aspects of things. And, you know, splitting the difference, understanding that Giffen in North Albany, there is a 22 where ultimately it's like a straight shot from the south end or from that catchment area to North Albany. And we, and of course, we looked at scatter plots of where you're actually li living in a catchment area in addition to like this charting and mapping on what the public transportation would be, what the time would be, and what the routes would be. And another thing to consider also is that there are other um, large scale projects and proposals and developments coming to Albany, and these neighborhoods are subject to change as well. So that's something to consider. So the demographics will shift, which makes 60348B a little uncomfortable. A crisis caused the fact of, you know, our inequitable feeder pattern with the closing of charter schools? And do we have that room? Do we have that flexibility before AP? I don't think so. Thank you very much. Board Member Krejci, when you're ready. Thanks. Um, I, I wanted to start by echo echoing something that Mr. Elman Yawi said, which is that when, when these options were presented to us, uh, one of the things that was said to us is, hey, these composite scores are give or take, they're, they are all much, all of these eight options are much better than what we have now. And we can't know whether a 9.92 is better than a 0.99 or whatnot. Um, the other thing is a lot of people have said, yes, you need to put equity first. We need to put equity first, not how people are affected. And I want to remind people that always part of the process, part of the quantitative part of the process, uh, was trying to measure the relative stress that various plans would have on the district, because even change of any sort, even positive change, is stressful for people. And one of the things that was put in as a non-biased part of the pro process was minimizing the number of school changes and minimizing the number of students who changed. But that's necessarily a very rough estimate of how much discomfort you'd be causing with the change because some, some elementary schools might not mind a change. They might actually want one. And some elementary schools might be really adversely affected by a change. So it's just a rough that was just a rough estimate and i think getting input from the public and getting input put from specific schools was really edifying to me in that respect and it's not that we would say well the people who commented the most matter more or their, their opinions matter more but it's just knowing where the discomfort points are where the pain points are for people that was really helpful the other thing that was helpful for me was looking at the individual composite scores of each of the middle schools. Because I think one thing we really have to realize is um, in an ideal world, we could create, if school leaders were creating three schools from scratch, 
and allocating the kids to each school, you know, they could do something that would be considering each kid, considering it in a vacuum. If you could teleport each kid to school, let's create three equal schools that will be the easiest to lead and that will lead to the strongest academic outcomes. But that doesn't really correspond to the reality of the city we have. The reality of the city we have is for most people, most people live closer to Hackett or Myers than they do to North Albany. And that's a fact. Many people do not want to send their kid to the school that's the furthest away. And while a lot of it is about distance, a lot of it may not be about racism or bias on the part of those parents, it is important to note historically because people have said, well, why did you have this third middle school way the heck up at North Albany? It's important to know that structurally racism is one of the reasons why that third middle school is up there. It's because Livingston was closed. It's because Westland, the neighborhood of Westland Hills sued to keep a middle school from being placed in their neighborhood. That is why that middle school is up there. But given that's a fact, I think we need to make that middle school better than the rest to make it desirable. I think it's very hard if you're telling a parent, well, based on the elementary school your child goes to, we're going to send, we're going to send him or her to the middle school that's furthest from their home. You're going to drive by two other schools to get to your school, but don't worry, they're all equally good. A parent's going to say, but if they're all equally good, why can't my kid go to one closer? And I think that's why I really lean toward, despite some of the issues with it, I really lean towards 60348B because that makes, while the composite score is high, the reason the composite score is high is because it makes North Albany stronger than the other two schools. It makes Myers weaker than the other two schools, but Myers is by far the most desirable location for people who live in the south and the south half of Albany. Um, you know, Tackett is not near as as many residential districts. You've got the hospital, you've got the universities, you've got a lot of traffic. Myers is squat middle of the walking dis within walking distance of a lot of elementary school students. So for me, it wasn't as much of an issue to have that school have a little bit higher of a composite score, meaning that it had more at-risk students. Um, the 543 grouping did give me some cause for concern because it's more unstable should things happen in the future. But on the other hand, the other two options that are very popular, this, the 25828B and the 67759C represent real, oh gosh, sorry. Those, those two options rep represent real, real discomfort, real inconvenience, and real pain uh, for the families of a number of elementary schools, not simply uh, the possibility of something unfortunate happening in the future. The thing, one of the things I like, uh, sorry, one of the things I like about 60348B, and one thing that really affected me of some of the stuff that's come in has been, uh, I like of 60348B that it keeps toast at Hackett. I like that it keeps the dual language program at Hackett. I like that it moves New Scotland to Myers because I think the overwhelming message we got from New Scotland parents was about transportation. And by shifting them to Myers, we're going to be enabling the more of them to walk to school, which is really what a lot of them talked about. That was a positive thing for them. And so that would continue. Um, I also really like that it splits up some of some of the very some of the schools with very activist, very active, very concerned, very vocal parents among the three schools because a lot of how as a district we get things done is through parents that roll up their sleeves, write letters, get grants, make phone calls, and spend their time working on behalf of those schools. Uh, Parents like the ones at Montessori, New Scotland, and dual language do a lot for our schools. And having one of each, uh, each of those schools at each of the three middle schools uh, for me would be very positive. I think for me, it's more appropriate to move Montessori to North Albany over New Scotland because Montessori is a magnet school and magnet schools were invented to Basically, the whole proposition of a magnet school is you give up the geogra geographical convenience of the school closer to your home in order to integrate the school district. And also because most, most Montessori magnet students 
would be relying on a bus to go to middle school regardless of where they go. And that's not the case for New Scotland. Uh, I do, it's unfortunate that this plan does move Ash to New Scotland because of course Ash is right next to Myers and that would be great. But I like, I like in general, this plan comes out for me with more winners than losers and more winners across the school, across the schools with more economic challenges and socioeconomic barriers, not just winners among the schools that we get all the commentary from. So that's that's my favorite. However, I understand it might be risky. I understand it might be riskier than some of the other ones, but I think we're in a position where we've had failures at not just at North Albany, because people have said it's, you know, hey, you have to look at who is leading the schools, you have to look at getting good principals, good teachers, et cetera. Uh, there, there have been issues with, there, there have been issues with middle schools on the north half of the city for the past 40 years. It's not about who is the leader in there, it's about how are we, how are we dividing up the kids and are we taking, these, taking kids, in many, many cases, kids that are growing up in generational poverty and essentially condemning them to a second class education. We can't do that anymore. I think we need to take risks. For that reason, I think even though it's riskier, I think this is this is the one that could really move the needle for me. However, if I had to choose a second choice, 67759C, although it bothers me, this one bothers me because the composite score at North Albany is a little bit lower than the others, which seems to be the opposite of where we're going. I still like it a little better then 25828B, but I can deal I can deal with those two as well. Just wanted to just wanted to say my piece for the one that I really strongly bear. Thanks. Thank you very much, Secretary Chitra. You know, we've had so many meetings, including last night. This is a tough decision. And it's a tough decision for every parent. So I mean I don't discount anything that anybody said because that's what you do. You advocate for your child. We don't have the luxury to do that. We have to look from a district perspective. And as was mentioned before, we wrote the equity policy. So we made a commitment to fix things that have been wrong for so long. They need to be fixed. So it's not a matter of let's kick the can down the road and fix it next year. No, that is not allowable. We have to fix it. So. I'm glad that we are in this position today, that we're thinking of taking a vote today and not kicking the can down the road. Um, you know, transportation was one of the things, walkers was one of the goals that people in the committee suggested, we want to minimize the number of people, kids who walk long distances. But a school, the first thing a school you go to school for is your academics, right? And that is what we looked at those numbers first, and that's what derives those composite scores. So we did the numbers, we came with the composite scores, and we, if we look at the current composite score, it's 4.3 something, right? So any of those scenarios that we had, even outside of these eight, were better than what we have. Right? So now you have to start picking other criteria, and that's where transportation walking came. And even in committee, I said, Yes, you can put people on a bus because they may prefer, but that's an assumption we are making. Some people may want to walk, right? Not everybody. So it's, it's hard to predict, but regardless, we are left with the, uh, the task of making that choice for people without having had that input. Right? So another consideration that came up was dual, just mode. They just mode, so they've gone to a new setting, they, they don't have a playground yet, but they've adjusted and they're, they're doing. So it's kind of unfair to have them to do it again. Being fiscal res fiscally responsible, well, we got to look at the staffing too. So if there is a teacher available at Hackett, it's much more easier to manage those resources better. So when Dual wanted to stay at Hackett, it made sense, right? So when you look at these eight scenarios, if you take out the ones that dual is not at Hackett, that leaves you with three. Okay. Now you get to the job, then you also have transportation to talk about. 
if you're, as was mentioned before, if you're in a magnet school, you have given up that neighborhood preference. Neighborhood schools have chosen that preference. Okay. Even, even so, it is, it's sort of unfair to pit a school against another school. But realistically, if you were to look at geographically, look at the schools and say, okay, where can you get to from point A to point B? I did not know much about Albany until I came on the board. And I liked the practice that we had where we had the board meeting at every school. Every meeting was at every school, pre-COVID, right? This is more convenient right now because with COVID, we can keep the settings. Hopefully, we'll go back to that again. And that allowed us to visit as board members to visit those different schools, see those different parts of the city, acclimatize us to what's there, what is it? And you know what? You know, I don't care what people, what you know, Times Union says or what anybody else says, you know, this part of the city, that part of the city. Schools are fine. Okay. Yes, they have challenges. The challenges come from outside the school. Okay. We can fix everything. But what we can try and do is fix things that are inside the school. The moment the kid enters the school, provide them with the right resources. That's what you know we're trying to do with this equity initiative. So now you're left with three choices. And then you have, if you look at the transportation, really New Scotland is landlocked and there isn't really much of a public transportation. You may have a car, you may not have a car. That goes for anybody, right? But do I have public transportation? I don't, if you're in New Scotland, okay? For whatever reason, you dual and New Scotland were together. So they were going out anyways, because we just, because we said dual had to stay at Hackett. New Scotland also followed that pattern. So that made sense. Okay, there are two criteria now that sort of justify that. And that leaves you with the other three, which was 6034B, 2582B, 6034AB, 2582B, and 67759C. 60348B again had that 543 5, scenario that we talked about. But that actually has a favorable. New Scotland is closer to Myers than it is to Hackett. So even the kids who are taking a bus from the New Scotland area to Hackett right now, they could walk. So, but the challenge that you have with the uneven distribution, I mean, right now, if you look at the current distribution, Hackett is five schools feeding into it. So you're really not solving that problem. And if anything changes with any one of the schools, we know things can change in Albany in a jiffy. We saw that with Brighter Choice. Brighter Choice open, Brighter Choice closed. Now you've got to find a place for 300 students. We are constantly looking for space, and we live in a city where there is none, right? The whole North Albany thing that, that you know, it was fortuitous in a way that YMCA was uh, closing down and we could buy their property and make an equitable middle school. And if you go back to those discussions, when we talked about equity all along, classrooms, everything, there was the auditorium. The initial proposal that came from the architects was a 500 people auditorium. I'm like, that's not equitable. If you want to do it right, do it right properly. And in board meeting, I flipped it. And what's going to happen next year, unfortunately, I wish it was ready by this year, but what's going to happen next year is an equitable auditorium. Regardless of which school feeds in there, you will have the space. That's cool because we've got the Y also as a running track, which other middle schools don't. So there is inequity there, right? But, you know, so yes, you got the challenge of distance, but you got other perks. You have a swimming pool. The other schools have a swimming pool. Now, I know we've had issues with the swimming pools in the current schools, but those are getting fixed, right? So things will happen. We have to give it time. There are so many issues, you can't fix them all at once. And we are trying. Believe me, we are trying. The district is trying. The board is trying. And you guys have been great by voicing your concerns and bringing it to the board. And it's not like we can we don't listen. We can listen, but we can't fix it all at once. It takes time. Now, when it comes to those, those so 6034, the, the problem I have is the uneven thing. That leaves me the other two. The other two, basically, the issue is, is, a, is a flip between Myers going or Ash going to North Albany. So here's where I'm torn. Right? If you were to talk about equity and, and you, you want to make sure that you're, you're spreading out your more challenging schools so there's good distribution, then that 
leaves you with 25828B over 6775C. However, if you were to look at the transportation issue again, and you want to minimize the number of walkers, ASH has more economically disadvantaged students than Montessori Garden School. So this is where I'm torn. One makes sense for one reason. The other one, again, from an equity standpoint, makes sense for the other reason, for the economically disadvantaged population who we are trying to give more opportunities for. So I'm going to leave it at that, and, and hopefully by the end of the discussion, I'll come to a conclusion. Thank you very much. I'm putting you down as 1.5 to reach this. Poor member Smith. Okay. Uh, first, uh, again, thanks to everyone who participated in, in this uh, committee process. Um, and I, I think I laid out who that was as well as my colleagues before me. So I really just want to thank them. Uh, and this includes uh, obviously parents and, uh, and, and any others who, who provided input into the survey process and into the forums. Um, I also just wanted to uh, appreciate my pro my colleagues laying out the thought process because I think it's very important for the community to know how you know each person has come to their thinking, um, and basically everyone uh, who's gone before me has uh, I believe I've gone through that same kind of process, um, and it's been challenging. I. Am probably uh, would say that I'm focused more on the equity, um, and uh, it's not that transportation isn't an issue for me, but I'm really more focused on the equity. And uh, I will just start right out by saying I identify 25828B as my choice, um, and that really has to do with the uh, lower performing uh, and high need schools being spread out across the three new middle schools. Dual remains at Hackett. Um, we have an enrollment balance. We've got, uh, I feel that transportation is comparable regarding the numbers served. Um, the low composite score uh, does mean that we're going to have a balance uh, of wraparound services that we need at each of the middle schools. And so um, for that reason, I'm sticking with my uh, choice 25828B, which I had come to before. Um, and my mind hasn't changed. I do, um, I just, I, again, I really appreciate all that my colleagues have said because there are things that you've said that resonated with, with me. Um, and the only point I want to clarify, maybe maybe someone did say this, minor thing, but um, Dr. Shatur, when you mentioned um, uh, the indoor track at um, North Albany, uh, the other thing here is that some of the other schools have some land mass around them. Um, and, you know, so I, I still think, hey, they got an indoor, they can do, you know, that's great. Um, and they have very little space to to roam around and wander, but um, there's a nearby park, I think sometimes that the school has used. But I, I do think that I'm, I just want to say, uh, you know, all any of joking aside with him, uh, that I feel that this is the most equitable and in line with our policies. And so that is where I am coming from. And um, and I am more uh, uh, happy about that choice because I I can see and understand what we do every year, but especially what we will do moving forward to ensure that transportation is not a barrier for our youngsters. Um, so uh, that's I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Board Member Smith. And really, I want to thank each of you for your thoughtful comments. Um, I know this has been a very difficult experience and stressful as we try and do what we believe to be the right thing in consultation with staff and in consultation with community. And it is not easy. Um, we have been through a lot on this board, um, many difficult decisions that we have faced. But this one probably has the most direct impact on the most people. And it is therefore the most emotional for folks. And it's really hard. As I said last week, what I know in my heart is that concentrating students with the most need in a single school is just not an acceptable situation, even if it's caused by longstanding racial se residential segregation. I really appreciate Board Member Wilson reminding us of our adopted equity policy and our commitment when we adopt a policy to live up to that. 
And I also remind everyone that the superintendent and her staff have made it abundantly clear that they know they can do a better job of educating every single student if we disrupt the current concentration of at-risk students at North Albany. We know from the research that at-risk students, as Damra says, rise to the occasion. As I say, do better when there is a better distribution of students and that students not at risk continue to do just as well. The research is perfectly clear. And as I said last week, I know that Albany's parents who don't have at-risk children know that because otherwise they would have chosen a place where they could surround their not at risk children with other not at risk children and that would not have been Albany Public Schools. They would have chosen a different set of schools. But we know that our children will be successful. And I want to be clear that what we're doing here is not shifting students around. That's not what this is about. The district is doing so many other things with curriculum, with instruction, with professional development, but creating buildings which have a balanced set of needs will allow those other things that we're doing to succeed. They will build the foundation that we need to succeed. So just like you all, I haven't changed a lot since last week. Last week, I said that my two favorite were the two pairs, 25828 A and B, 67759 B and C. That's still true. I really want to thank everyone who took the time to share their thoughts by email, by survey, by coming to meetings, virtually, in person. I know how busy we all are. We are all incredibly busy, and yet people made the time to do that because they really think this is an important decision, and their commitment of making that time was very helpful to me. I read every single email, and I have responded to about 98% of them. Those of you who are still waiting response, the responses are coming. And I read every single state survey, and I was at every single meeting and I heard every single comment. I heard the concerns. I heard the empowering, really fabulous speeches from our parents in favor of equitable distribution of resources. And I heard the real concerns from families. And if I had a magic wand, I would grant every person's request. I would put every child in the school closest to their house. I would make all of the bus lines direct so that every family could get to every school. But there's no scenario like that. We are living in a city that is described by, re by redlining. We know what our city looks like. It is what every Northeastern city looks like. And that is the scenarios that we're dealing with. So there's not a perfect scenario. We can't give everybody what they want. There's not a perfect scenario in the eight. There's not a perfect scenario in the 60. And I don't believe there's a perfect scenario in the 500,000, okay? And that was all of them. So there is no perfect here. What we have to do is figure out what we each believe will serve the district as a whole the best. And I still believe, as I did last week, that the two 25828 scenarios have the best distribution of schools. I think that concentrating Giffen with any other of the three lowest performing schools is really truly problematic. Giffen is only slightly smaller than North Albany. I mean, New Scotland, it is our second largest school. And I really am troubled by any scenario that pairs it with one of our other really struggling schools. So that puts me at 25828 A or B. And between the two, I am really swayed by the fact that Toast belongs near Hackett and Ash belongs near Myers. I, I just find it really hard to understand how we would not allow those natural pairs to stay where they are. They're so close to each other. So if I were a board of one, I would really seriously be looking at 25828A because I think it would reap those benefits despite the difficult transportation situation it creates for New Scotland families, and it does. For New Scotland families with cars, it creates a difficult situation. And for New Scotland families without cars, it creates a very difficult situation. But I think it's worth it because it also places Giffen at Hackett. When Giffen goes to Hackett, most of the families don't have reliable transportation and they can walk to school. And I think that that is important. Giffen, again, is our second largest family, our second largest school. Um, this scenario was also in the top three for six 
out of the 12 schools. When you look at the surveys school by school, the vast majority or that half of our schools put it in the top three in every school, even New Scotland put it sixth or better. That was the only scenario for which that was true. Every other scenario had at least one school putting it seven or eight. I dislike strongly that it would create a second transition for dual families. I really don't want that. Um, I've spoken about that from the very first meeting. So I think that that is a strike against it. But if I were a board of one, 25828A is where I would put my vote. But I'm not a board of, vote, a board of one. And it's clear that there's nobody else who is enamored of 25828A as I am. So that leaves me at 25828B again, because I think that the 25828 pairs have a better distribution of students than the 67759 pairs. So I that would be my second choice would be 25828B. Um, and that I think is the key thing I wanted to say um, about how I got where I got. Board member man. Well, I certainly appreciate your comments, um, President Savage, along with my board colleagues. Like before we go further, can we talk about next steps for this part of the discussion? Thanks. That is a fabulous segue because we have, I've spoken to the officers twice about like, well, what are we going to do next? How are we going to manage this process? Because this seems really tricky. So what I have been doing is taking notes um, about who said what. And I will say, tell you that um, there are three scenarios that were mentioned by one person. That was 76882A, which Tabitha mentioned, 60348B, which Ellen mentioned, and 25828A, which I have just given, given an impassioned defense of. Um, I think that those three and the three that we have, nobody has spoken in favor of, we need to remove from the conversation because I think it's highly unlikely that we would have four votes for any of those. Does that seem like a reasonable next step? Okay. So that means, oh, and I can't see Vicki now, yes. Okay, so we're going to take away everything except 25828B and 67759C, which should sound very familiar because these are the two that keep rising to the top for various, various reasons. Um, and so now I think um, certainly Ellen and I, who both placed our first vote, on one that has now been eliminated. This is what we call ranked choice voting like they did in New York City this year for the first time. Should have the opportunity to um, look at our second choice. And I think, Ellen, if I recall correctly, you had set 67759C as your second choice, is that right? And it still is, but I'm, I'm still not a board, I'm still not a board of one. And as much as I like some things about it, when I look at the individual composite score of each of those schools, it leaves North Albany slightly weaker than the other two schools, and that's contrary to that's contrary to our goals. Two five eight two eight B gives gives um, North Albany a composite score that's in the middle of three, and they're also more closely distributed, such that they might be within the margin of error. So. 25828B, it seems like everyone's really happy with that one, and I'm not adverse to voting for it. Okay, and I've already stated that my, that is my second choice. Um, it was first choice for Vicki, Damaris, and Tabitha, as long as I'm tracking. I'm looking for eye contact to make sure I didn't screw anybody's votes up. And Mr. One and a Half over here has um, a half a vote on both 25828B and 6559C. And I didn't know if you wanted to make any further comment on what you're thinking is now after having listened to other folks. Again, transportation of Ash versus Montessori, where we have it, it pretty much it, it's a question of 47 versus 70 some student. But Ash, it doesn't change for Montessori. That was one consideration. On the other hand, you got the disparate distribution of the low uh, or highly challenged schools in that scenario. So, you know, having the in the other scenario. So having the distribution versus transportation. It's very difficult. So it's difficult, but at the same time, what is it that we're trying to do? What is the end goal? 
The end goal is to minimize the highly uh, the, the need to, to to maximize the resources that we can provide at every school. So we don't have a high need situation where there are just aren't enough resources that we can provide to a building and more people need it will be something that I would have to favor. It's sort of like asking which child do you love more, right? But I, I would go for two eight. Ms. Jomaniwe, did you want to have another chance to speak? Okay. So I'm just going to be completely honest. 25828B is not my first choice. It's not. But I also want to recognize that we all need to come together right now. Every single person, whether I like it or not, whether you like it or not, we have to embrace it. And I don't want to be at odds with anybody on this because I want to be a team and I want to work towards a solution for our problem. If I am not going to kick and scream regarding my number one choice, my number two choice is just as good. I want to reiterate that North Albany is going to be a fantastic school and uh, also just touch on what the TCCE students said about changing the perception. Like, I, I don't even, I can't come up with a better line than that. So like, I'm, I'm a little upset, but at the same time, I know we're going to be okay so long as everybody works together. So there's that. Thank you for those very exceptionally excellent remarks. I appreciate you. Ms. Wilson, did you want to say something? Just that, um, I don't think you, I don't want to, I wanted to circle back where I don't want you to feel that you feel at odds with anyone. You have your reasons, you know, and your rationale and we're listening to each other. So it's not definitely not a pitchforks thing at all. And um, I want to highlight that, you know, again, using mass data to make an equity driven decision. I understand some families aren't going, uh, wouldn't be going where they thought they would be going, but there is the caveat we are entertaining as we make this transition because it's only sixth grade currently. If you have a sibling at a certain school, that is still something, sibling preference is still something, open enrollment is still something as we, you know, age out individuals and things and we normalize this process. And again, appreciate anyone who mentioned 60348B for the reasonings that they mentioned it because again, trying to keep the proximity concept or even when you indicated Anne about the um, proximity concept in 25828A, I think we're all trying to and struggling with trying to accommodate that. So I just wanna appreciate that, that we entertained it. But again, we our charge and our task in this process is feeder alignment or the design of the enrollment pattern that would be equitable. So it's, you know, it's, it's driven by that primarily, and that's what we are trying to highlight. Ms. Smith, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, just a final thing. I mean, again, I, I want to say, as I started, that I do appreciate each one of my colleagues and uh, your your thought process and, um, and what your re uh, recommendation is. Um, and that doesn't change the fact that we're going to continue to work together. Uh, if, if it, if it, impacts our ability to work together, then we've got another problem and a bigger problem. Okay. So I just want to make that point very clear up front. This is not about, you know, respecting uh, the opinions of each person, but I, and I like your point that we do have to though come together. Um, and I think I just wanted to add, um, and, and I'm not picking on board member Krejci, but I, um, the other thing, and you sort of solidified it for me, that the 60348B would not be my choice because I don't want to have North Albany stronger and another, you know, and Myers weaker. They all have to be strong. This Because here's what ha has happened historically. Because we shift students around one year or four years, it might be Hackett that's horrible, and nobody wants to go to Hackett, right? 
The next year, something's going on at Myers. Nobody wants to go to, to Myers. And of course, almost nobody wants to go to North Albany. Well, th this we can't have that. We can't have this sort of shift in the viewpoints and the dynamics. Everything we do for each of our schools has to be equitable and it has to be as dynamic and as exciting and as robust with high expectations um, for all. And so for that reason, I really have to, you know, eliminate, and I did eliminate 603-48B. Um, and I find that the 25828B is, gets to the equitable piece for me. And I know even saying that, that it may, it's going to mean that some parents aren't gonna be happy, some families aren't gonna be happy, um, but I feel like there's a level of distribution that, um, that is workable um, because we're getting to our primary goal of equity. Board member Chitour. So what you know, Vicky said was absolutely true. We want all schools to be better. And more importantly, fast forward three years from now, where are these gonna, kids going to go? We have one high school, right? If you make all schools better, the high school is going to be even better. These kids today, they're doing great in athletics, they're doing arts, robotics, you name it. Every, every week we're hearing something new that these kids are achieving. And think of the potential that would happen three years from now when we fix the middle schools and all these kids end up in the high schools. Board member me. And let's not forget the graduation rate and how it's been, you know, increasing over time. So. So I appreciate you all so much and all that you have said, and I think it is now time to entertain a motion to adopt 25828B as the new feeder pattern to begin in the 22-23 school year. Can we get motion? I'll make that motion. I'll make it. By Board Member Smith, second by Bo Board Member Mann. All in favor? That is a unanimous decision. Thank you all very much. We look forward to further updates on the implementation thereof and put that in the capable hands of Superintendent Adams and her staff. Thank you so much. Everybody can breathe now. And now we are going to keep going on the agenda because as you all have seen, we don't just do one thing here in the City Schools of Sri Balboni. We are constantly juggling, juggling many things. We have one more action item today, which is we have a couple of policies that we talked about at our last board meeting that are before us now for action. Dr. Chatur. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. We actually have a few uh, policies for discussion as well as a few policies for action from last time. So uh, the policies for discussion, the first one is 0150105, which is the equity policy. And this policy, we was for, when we first made it, uh, since there was no NISBA policy, and we call it 0050, now it's numbered 0105 to be in line with the NISBA's numbering. The policy went through an extensive review through various stakeholder forums, and the new language includes recommendations from the community, the students, and other stakeholders. The policy also calls for establishment of district-wide and school-level equity committees and teams that will help develop and monitor and implement these initiatives. Did I miss anything, Superintendent? 8332 is use of district cell phones. This policy is up slightly updated to reflect the current operational expectations and practices. 9240 is recruiting and hiring. And this policy was revised to add text related to the recruiting practices that align it to the equity policy we just talked about, 0105. Of note is the language. The board and the district have determined that it, that uh, had determined that it's important for staff to reflect the student body that we serve. Therefore, the district will take active steps to hire individuals who live within the city of Albany or individuals who have been educated by the city school district of Albany when all other minimum qualifications are equal between two candidates. And this is a significant step that we are making. Um, 9710 is travel and conferences. The last sentence of the policy was amended to change from monthly to yearly reports. Um, so those are the policies for discussion. Do, we, do any of you have any questions on these policies? I want to just make one comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I have a comment. Um, and it's it's about timing. So we just voted on a feeder pattern that um, was equitable. 
And um, back in uh, October of 2020, we brought on board the equity and education policy. We were doing some revisions tonight. And with intent, um, the district has made equity at the front and center of everything that we do. And I just, I really wanted to point that out. That's pretty profound. This is very important to our district. And so, um, so I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also wanted to just make one quick comment and thanks to the um, superintendent staff and the policy committee for bringing forward the changes to 9240 recruiting and hiring, which has been a real priority for me ever since I read the study regarding the real, real impact of uh, teachers of color on graduation rates, especially for uh, especially for children of color, but especially for poor boys of color. Even one African-American teacher in their elementary grades can have a significant outcome on um, graduation rate. And while it is not legal to uh, hire or select staff on the basis of race, I am, opt I am optimistic that if we are focused on hiring folks who are graduates of the City School District of Albany or who live in the City School District of Albany, that will give us an increased opportunity to um, incentivize people who live here to want to work for our school district. So I think this is a really exciting step that we're moving towards and it's a really important one and I've been hoping for it and working for it for some time. So I'm really excited about it. Thank you very much. Ms. Smith? Right, and sorry to duplicate, be duplicative, but I, I definitely agree with uh, President Savage's comments there um, and wholeheartedly support this. I also want to express my gratitude to the uh, various uh, in, folks involved in this, the committee. Um, I think having um, a bit more of an explicit uh, inclusion of an anti-racist position mm -hmm. uh, in this statement, uh, equity policy rather, I think is very important. Um, and I also want to say to the board, I am looking forward as part of our goals to the work that we will do together that really helps us to um, to to better understand collectively uh, what it means to be anti-racist, what it means to be more equitable. I think we've made some tremendous strides um, thanks to really a, a whole lot of effort, uh, not just on our part, but our board and cabinet, uh, superintendent and cabinet, and as well as the teachers and others who've started doing a lot of the culturally responsive education work beforehand, but we've got a ways to go. And I just wanted to just just express my gratitude that that through this policy we will be able to move um, our collective vision forward into action to make a real difference for every single one of our kids. So um, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so let's go on to the, the action items. These are the policies we talked about last week. Um, I'm gonna, I would like to have make a motion to have all of them together. Is um, there any reason we can't take these together? Okay, go for it. Okay. Motion to do them all. Board member Wilson, second by board member Krejci. All in favor? That's unanimous, fantastic. I'm amazed to tell you that that is the end of our action agenda. That is the longest action agenda I think we have had um, in quite some time. Um, we could take an action later in the meeting. We do not intend to take an action later in the meeting, but it could happen. But now we move to the discussion portion of our agenda, which is the capital project update. And while that gets teed up, Board Member Wilson has something she would like to say. Just because I forgot to mention this in the transition, but when we spoke about equity and you know, in lieu of the decision that we just made, I do want to just take a pause and highlight there are some individuals whom we haven't heard from and we'll hear about our decision in retrospect, but I feel that we all made a decision that even if you were finding out tomorrow, six months from now, that there's some kind of change, we made an equitable decision. Superintendent Adams. Good evening again, and I, before we go into the capital project, I do want to say that um, it is an honor to be able to sit here and to work alongside this board. And I think that um, I echo that from cabinet uh, with regard to the decisions that our board is making and seeing that you are true to what we say, think, feel, and believe about equity. Because again, 
you know, we took the time to define equity. We did that in 2018 and 19. And then we looked at how we actualize equity. What's the evidence of it? And as we entered into the phase of operationalizing equity, we knew that it would be tough because this is the toughest part of the work. How do we make it part of how we do business and make it the central focus of what we do? We have started looking at our policies as we review them through the equity lens. We look at our practices through an equity lens. We have equity teams at our schools, both at the adult and the student levels. And some of the student levels are still in process and working together to build. But it is when we say this is what we are about and we do those things that echo that, that say, here's what we're going to do in our practices and procedures and understanding that this is so much bigger than any one of us. And for the generations of people that I know I have heard from with regard to some of the inequities and social justice issues that our city faces, you know, this is one of those steps that will help us break down those systemic barriers that create obstacles for our children and prevents them from being successful. And what you've just done is you've opened the door for all of our students to be able to be successful and they're on the level playing field. And so I say thank you, um, regardless of the decision, you, you stood up and made the decision. And for that, um, we are very proud of that and we're ready to do the work to implement and make it a success. So thank you very much. Thank you, and I will also, um, I just want to commend the board for the exceptional quality of civic discourse um, and particularly commend board member Al Miyawi for whom this was a very difficult um, situation and um, your, your grace and graciousness is exceptional and your commitment to the district will never be forgotten. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, to put it simply, I think that we all, especially those with with privilege, if, if that's the simplest way to put it, need to sacrifice. And it's sacrifice for the greater good. It's not going to hurt us that much. So I'm happy. Thank you um, so much. I'm comfortable with my decision. We appreciate you. And now on to the Capital Project Update. Ms. Roaring. Good evening once again. We are going to do part two of our capital project update for this quarter. Um, with me this evening, we have representatives from Turner Construction, CS Arch, and Tetra Tech. I will lead off with the high school update. Um, Bill Steele from Turner is here to present that with Mr. Peckham. We will also hear from Zach Cole and Ms. Bruns in the five-year plan. Very good, let me share my screen. Overall schedule, uh, the high school project has been uh, divided into four phases. We are uh, with phase one and phase two currently occupied. Phase three is the construction of the media center, new main entry, uh, partial academic building, gymnasium, athletic renovations, and auditorium. Uh, partial occupancy is scheduled for fall of 2022, including the media center, and the new uh, CTE spaces. Uh, full occupancy is scheduled for fall of 2023. Uh, phase four, which is the academic building renovation, uh, is uh, scheduled for occupancy fall of 2025. Construction update in the auditorium, uh, the uh, furring and sheetrock is on the walls. That's uh, complete. Uh, taping is in progress. Stage rigging and electrical rough-ins uh, continue. In the cosmetology and media labs, the cosmetology uh, uh, millwork is installed. Uh, ceilings are uh, near completion. Door and hardware installation is underway. And in the media labs, uh, drywall is complete 
and taping is underway. The loft building update, uh, millwork is complete. First floor taping is ongoing. Automotive and building trade uh, work is, uh, is ongoing as well. Uh, painting is uh, ongoing in the second and third floors. Uh, ceiling work and flooring work uh, is ongoing as well. For the courtyard update, the steel erection is complete. Uh, temporary enclosure for due to the winter is complete. Uh, all the concrete slabs have been placed. Uh, foundation leave out uh, is, uh, is, is underway. The uh, mechanical electrical plumbing uh, rough ends are, are well underway. And framing drywall and taping is underway uh, in a number of areas. The uh, concrete masonry or CMU is underway uh, for the uh, stairwells and interior partitions and elevator shaft is complete. Potential change orders. Uh, winter weather, uh, we held uh, 75,000 for potential change orders re related to winter weather. Uh, concrete additives, uh, change order requests submitted 17,446. Uh, dollars. There's no additional exposure. It's been closed out. Uh, roof snow removal change order uh, request anticipated for $2,050. Uh, no additional exposure. The frost removal at the uh, at the uh, foundation leave out change order request submitted for $4,471. There's no additional exposure there. Uh, temporary enclosure and heat. This uh, change order request submitted for $64,299. Turner has uh, returned uh, this to the GC for revisions, and, um, and we anticipate that uh, it will be decreased uh, after, uh, after review in, uh, of our comments. Total cost uh, above was $88,506. And it's 13,506 over above uh, our hold. Uh, but once again, uh, after our review uh, of comments uh, by uh, AOW, the GC, uh, we anticipate this uh, to uh, be decreased. This is a preparation for the next slide. Potential unforeseen conditions and future work and contingency status. We're in the process of, re, of reviewing the contingency burn rate and exposure for unforeseen conditions, uh, particularly as it relates to the existing boiler room and bridge demolition, which is uh, additional abatement, de possible deterioration of steel, and some uh, logistics adjustments. Uh, we'll continue to review potential unforeseen conditions with the with the district in conjunction with potential design changes to the existing scope. So right now the con construction contingency review. Our current construction contingency balance as of March 4th is $511,541. Uh, the burn rate exceeds expectations. The balance is 15% of, of, of the original, 3.43% of work left to put in place, and it started at 7.5%. Looking to the column on the left, open items, uh, costs that are included in the contingency balance above, we have uh, several categories. Uh, first category is open items, scope of work necessary must-haves uh, girl locker room uh, modifications uh, 31,200 uh, tower air handling unit controls this is for towers two five and six uh, to get the air handling units uh, uh, functioning uh, for for future phases uh, this is a, a rough order of magnitude cost at the ten thousand dollars which would put the current uh, work necessary at $41,207. Open items, future work with high priority, 
is the athletic department changes, which is the expansion of the girls team room. Uh, this is a uh, estimated amount of $21,000. The next line, gender neutral uh, locker room relocation. That is, we're estimate, estimating it to be a, a wash. You're relocating the gender neutral from one side of the corridor uh, to the other. Um, and so it's should be no cost to change for just relocating it. The exterior scope for the district uh, modular home build program, uh, we have a ROM rough order of magnitude of $79,000. Uh, that uh, added in a uh, retaining wall, some pavement, uh, uh, fencing, uh, and uh, required uh, additional earthwork to accommodate those features. Railings at top of stairs. Uh, this would cover all three phases. Uh, first two phases that are complete, and then the current phase, uh, raising the uh, the guardrail on the top by six inches. Uh, we've uh, developed a budget for ROM of thirty-eight thousand dollars. So work with high priority, uh, totaling approximately one hundred thirty-eight thousand um, dollars. The next category is uh, open items, uh, which is future work, lower priority. Uh, phase two, fabric uh, sound panel replacements, it's 30,000. The phase two sound panel replacements is uh, 10,000. Doors at the, at the gym for phase one addition and first floor uh, A4 by uh, by the uh, stair is uh, 36,000. That's basically adding in a couple of quarter partition with uh, operable doors with mag hold uh, devices for hardware, uh, fire alarm, electrical that would be required for that. And then uh, a new LED uh, display sign, a monument sign out by the street, out by Washington Avenue uh, is 25,445. The auditorium first floor finish modifications, uh, scope of work uh, is uh, to be determined. We have a, a hold or a ROM of $5,000 for that work. Now, what we have on the uh, very bottom here is a potential uh, claim. There's for uh, steel material escalation, $470,051. Uh, the uh, district's uh, counsel, uh, Jeff Honeywell, uh, recommended holding uh, the full amount of the steel material escalation cost as a best practice. The value can be adjusted once we uh, review the validity, which is in progress uh, right now. Uh, the column to the right is po uh, potential risk uh, for future work. This was discussed on the earlier slide. These items are not included in the contingency balance above. Uh, asbestos at the bridge and boiler room. Uh, we have an estimated ROM of, of $25,000. Water line, uh, there's a, a tap, provide a new line of fire hydrant removal uh, for, the, uh, for the construction site trailer in Tower 6. Uh, this feeds the uh, standpipe that would be in that is in Tower Six. Uh, steel miscellaneous connections, miscellaneous reinforcing to existing. Um, this goes back to the earlier comment uh, about um, hidden deterioration uh, through the years. Uh, the facility was built in the 70s, so it's seen a lot of moisture and and um, and rust, and uh, we've had some incident or some issues in in earlier phases. Logistics uh, we're, is $30,000. This is for miscellaneous support uh, for facility shutdowns, uh, crossovers, protection, uh, delays. Uh, this is uh, intended to, uh, you know, accommodate uh, any um, unforeseen that may uh, come up as we get into uh, the next phase um, and also to to accommodate, uh, you know, potential uh, you know, uh, academic uh, uh, programs or needs. 
and uh, disposal removal miscellaneous uh, school items, uh, $5,000 is, is being held. So overall, potential uh, risk uh, f f for future work where we have a uh, estimated budget around $90,000. And uh, none of this can really be fully calculated because it's just that it's unfor for potential unforeseen conditions. The contingency status with the risk included, the current contingency balance is 511,541. You add in the uh, potential uh, risk up above or subtract the potential risk, leaves a revised contingency balance of 421,541, which this is for the percent of work uh, to put in place is at a, a 2.83%. So general items for discussion is, is the phase two construction contingency balance has transferred to phase three, which is 196,418. Item shown is potential risk. Revisit after risk diminishes. We can we can revisit uh, the uh, uh, these items once we get past uh, October, November. When we're well underway with uh, our demolition and our earthwork and in, in, in a lot of these risks have uh, passed or, or surfaced. Hopefully they're just in the past and we don't have any. The LED uh, display sign uh, for, for the monument sign. Another option is to potentially replace the modules for the current sign for $5,500. The uh, pricing for a third option for a different sign model is in progress. Uh, per the facilities committee meeting on 3-8, um, if the savings is, you know, in the thousands uh, from the uh, $25,000 sign, uh, we've been authorized to uh, proceed with that option. Uh, and the, the other option is, is does the district want to consider any other funding sources, building budgets for future work items? So there's a lot on that one slide. Kimberly, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. Not at this Not time, time, Mr. Steele. I think we're good to go to the next slide. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Overall approved changes, total items 281. Uh, it's been approved to date is $1,056,616. Uh, total open changes, there's 55 items. Uh, for totaling 630, 633000 roughly $300. Uh, changes in with the client for approval, nine, uh, around for roughly $91,000. And changes in with the architect for review, uh, 20 items are around uh, $274,221. Uh, changes with Turner for review, none. Uh, changes waiting on contractor pricing, 26. And this based on a ROMs of 268,134. And then down below is the uh, claim for uh, steel, escal steel escalation potential claim, $470,000. So just to recap, the starting contingency was 3,324,271. Remaining contingency is 511,541. That's a percent remaining of 15%, but the percent remaining based on remaining volume or work to put in place is 3.43%. So before we go on to phase four, since there's a pause, I'm, I'm assuming that the next step here is for the facilities committee to come together and discuss this in more detail and then recommendation will come out of facilities committee to the board at some point relatively soon as you as you work through these details. Is that what I should expect next? Yes, that would be correct. Fantastic. We will await further information from the facilities committee. Thank you. Okay. Then the next part is just a brief update on the status of the phase four design. I think there's been a couple 
changes since the presentation of the full board three months ago. So this is just the overall first floor plan of the building. Um, the phase four area is on the next slide that we'll we'll get into a little more detail on. And you can see here that the phase four area largely includes the lower part of it's the two cafeterias, the serving lines in the kitchen in the green area. The pinkish color is special ed classrooms. And we've been able to move a couple of the special ed classrooms down from the second floor to the first floor where they ideally be. And then uh, towards the left hand area of this is going to be the student entrance. You can see in the in the lighter yellow um, two vestibules, a security check in area. And then we've been able to accommodate four metal detector lines coming in to increase the um, the timing that they can get the students in the building here before we had two lines with uh, kind of like a snake line, but we've uh, come up with a way to actually have four separate lines in this area. Go to the next slide. Um, so this is the second floor overall plan. And again, the two thirds of the old academic building is what's being renovated as part of, of phase four. And this is where uh, one of the significant changes from the schematic design has occurred. I'll get into the detail of that if we can just go to the next slide, Bill. So as you can see, this floor, the dark blue areas are areas that um, are CTE based or project be the way based um, to be able to accommodate some of our uh, budget challenges with the current construction market, we relocated the culinary and the maker and the project lead the way spaces from the first floor to the second floor. Those are the dark blue spaces towards the right hand side of the um, of the screen. The culinary lab and the culinary classroom um, directly off the elevator area. There's an elevator there in the stair tower towards the lower part of the slide. Um, that's Probably the only concern with moving that function to the second floor is the delivery of um, the food supplies for the culinary lab. And when they're doing catering projects, taking the stuff out. So we located it directly um, opposite the elevator access. So they'll be able to bring that in relatively easily. And then the dark blue areas on the next area up are the project lead the way maker space and then three technology classrooms associated with the maker space. By moving it to the second floor, we had the option of getting all three of those spaces, classroom spaces to have direct access to the maker space. The other program that has been discussed before that's been added to the left hand side of this is the barbering program. With the growth of that program, it needed a separate space and not being part of the of the cosmetology program. So that created that function there. And then the rest of this floor is um, a couple of science classrooms in the upper right hand area of it, and then general classrooms. Um, the connection across, uh, we have a strong, um, clear line of sight connection across from this area now right into the phase one corridor um, in that area also. We go to the third floor plan, the next floor. Again, this is the overall plan. You can see at that connection point and that clear axis across from the, all the way across from the third floor of the phase one addition all the way through to this phase four area. And then we've added those two classrooms in kind of at the, um, where we're creating the courtyard to pick up two classrooms in that area. Going to the next floor plan, um, this just shows the overall, uh, this is really the fourth uh, complete small learning community with four science classrooms and then the rest of them being general classrooms, some of which will be used for special ed classrooms, and then the, the full complement of the administrative office suite in the middle with teacher planning and some additional offices. And I believe that's the end of the high school presentation. Um, just the overall, as far as the the update goes, that um, 
we'll be submitting the design development documents. The last piece of being able to do that was kind of setting the the kitchen and servery plan, which were largely established the major parameters of that with a meeting this afternoon. Um, and then uh, the estimate, Turner will be doing an estimate um, which is scheduled to be complete around April 22nd, and then we'll review and make sure that's all accurate and share that with the administration, the facilities committee. And then after we have the phase four estimate, we'll do any additional review necessary with um, the high school instructional staff and, and administrative staff and determine if there's any uh, changes need to be done before we go and complete the construction documents. Um, we anticipate submitting it to state ed around the end of August with approval in February so we can go out to bid at that point in time and uh, the current schedule is to be able to award the contracts in early April. Board colleagues. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Peckham, I apologize in advance if there aren't as many questions as usual. We are in a rather, <laughs> rather long week here in the City School District of Albany. Anyone with a question for Mr. Peckham? Dr. Chitor. Quick question. Can you remind me when the auditorium will be complete? The the auditorium will be back online for the for the main floor of it at the start of the school year in September. And then there's a little bit of additional work, the full occupancy of with the um, balcony and everything will be in October. Okay, so by spring of year after it should be completely done. Oh yeah, by next by next spring it'll be all 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 complete and been in use for a while. I'm missing my musicals. Thank you. Board Member Smith. Yeah. Me too. Um, I just wanted to hear, uh, well, again, thank the committee, uh, Mr. Peckham and Mr. Hunt and everyone involved. Uh, and just to make note that we do have our next committee meeting on April 12th. Um, and I think at this time we're still remaining virtual, but that may change. Uh, we'll, we'll talk that over and, um, and post accordingly. So thank you. Anyone else with a question? If not, then what's next? Uh, next, we'll provide an update on the five-year plan. Mr. Cole. Good evening, everybody. My name is Zachary Cole. I'm the assistant superintendent on the district five-year plan. I'll be starting off today with a presentation at uh, Sheridan Prep. That's the first school on the list. So over the last break, we were able to begin uh, installing some steel that's gonna be supporting the new rooftop unit going over that gym. Uh, we're 75% complete with the steel, 50% complete with the mechanical piping. Uh, upcoming work will be in the spring break where we'll finish the remaining steel and we'll begin setting our, our getting our roof penetration set for the new units. Hackett, this photo is a little bit old. I think you can see the dated uh, 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 stamp on the photos 114, but I think it's a great photo to highlight some of the work we were able to get uh, completed uh, during a virtual week that the school conducted back in January. Uh, the stage four looks great. We received a lot of compliments. Uh, flooring contractor did a really good job. Um, also over the winter break, we were able to get the north or the south stair tower uh, tread replacement uh, installed. Um, and we will be planning to do the north stair tower over the winter or the spring break. Arbor Hill, uh, the schedule is progressing nicely. Um, area A is is very well along its way. Uh, you can see the new storefront installed on the left hand side there. The only thing missing are those are the black panels that go in uh, with the where you can see the plywood. Otherwise, they look great. Uh, we've been receiving some of our doors already, which is good news considering the lead times um, and the concerns we had with those. Um, since this presentation was put together, uh, moisture mitigation system has been completed. Um, ceiling panels are, are uh, in progress right now. And MEP rough-ins are 100% complete. So overall, this is progressing really nicely in this area. 
Uh, same thing with this photo at Giffen, uh, the group two bathrooms are well along the way. We actually in the bathroom in this photo actually has floor tile has since been painted and lights are in. Uh, so the next step is going to be the wall tile. And again, we are progressing nicely with these bathrooms as well. Uh, they are planned for turnover on spring break. Uh, Toast, this is the group one bathrooms. I apologize for the older photo, uh, but since the group two bathrooms are well in progress, we are uh, just just behind the first, uh, the last photo I just showed you at the group two bathrooms at Giffen. Um, there is tile expected to go within the next week and paint going in tomorrow. So overall, they're progressing nicely. We did have a constraint there with the electrical scope, uh, but as, the, as it was presented, the facilities committing, we have since been able to proceed with that work and there have been no delays. Some ads and credits that we've been, uh, that we've seen recently for the project. So the first one is Arbor Hill, the lighting in the storage room. It wasn't originally part of the scope of work. It is totaling uh, close to uh, $9,500. Um, we're considering other options at the moment. Uh, PCO 134, the TOAST Group 2 bathroom requires the electrical scope. That's what I just mentioned on the previous slide. Since we've been able to proceed with this work, uh, we were actually get that price a little bit lower. Um, we were something, you know, we worked with the contractor um, to get a fair and honest price. Uh, credits for the project. Uh, this It's good to see some money come back into the budget. So the Myers Tennis Court, uh, we were able to achieve the same goal we originally intended for um, and also bring some money back into the picture. So that was a big benefit. Um, the Tony Clements window film, that was removed from the scope of the project. Um, I know it has since been completed uh, separately. Uh, Arbor Hill storage room, uh, we did find some flooring that was in excellent condition. Uh, so we were able to uh, save some funds there as well. So uh, current potential changes that we're tracking is roughly 37 that has since changed, uh, but we're floating right around that same number and the value is still similar right around $69,000. I keep the value engineering in there just to highlight uh, some of the work that was done at the beginning of the project uh, to achieve the same goal, uh, but just to bring that $645,000 back into the budget. Uh, changes approved to date, we have 58, totaling 381,000. Changes currently with the client are one. Changes with the architect are 16. Changes with Turner are seven. And changes waiting on contractors. We're still waiting around 10. Um, we've since been able to receive a couple of them, and I do expect them by the end of this week. Uh, changes paid to date are 313,000. And changes paid by allowance is just one at $732. So our starting contingency was 960,000 and we're currently sitting at 542. That's 57% remaining. And based on that remaining volume, that's 5.34%. Excellent. Thank Does you. Does anybody have any questions? More colleagues, any questions? I just want to echo what Dr. Chatur said earlier about getting back to being in schools. I can't wait to have a board meeting in each school so that we can see many of these things as part of our no normal course. I know we could arrange a tour, but it's just wonderful when we can um, just use the facilities and be in them. Um, anything else? Superintendent Adam. At this time, I just wanted to extend a lot of um, kudos and thank you to um, Vice President Smith and the uh, Facilities Committee. Thank you for all of the work that you do. Um, Ms. Roaring, thank you for your leadership in this area. And also, um, as always, Mr. Peckham, thank you so very much uh, for all of your work uh, with CS Arch and everything that you do to assist as we get everything turned into the State Department. And sometimes we need those quick turnarounds and you know we have to make sure that we're facilitating that. And uh, Mr. Hunt and Mr. Cole, thank you as well. We appreciate the work that you bring to the table. And I'm not sure how many of you have had the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Steele, who is our GM. He's the new Scott, new uh, Zach, new <laughs> John Dawes. He's the new, new, new of those three gentlemen. 
And so, Mr. Steele, I do want to take this opportunity to say welcome aboard. Thank you so very much. Um, we appreciate and value what you bring to the table. Um, you have just jumped right in and held us together and, and still maintaining those positive relationships that we have, not only among each other, but with our vendors. And um, by that, I mean our subcontractors. And thank you so very much. Your wealth of knowledge and skill that you bring um, is very welcomed. And so we just appreciate you. And I know that we've not met you here in person at the board meeting. Um, you will definitely have your opportunity, though. Uh, Look forward to it. But we just wanted to welcome you and say thank you very much for all that you're doing. Thank you very much. All right. I see and you. Ellen, I see you. I'm I'm sorry. I didn't mean to leave you out, but I do see you. And um, and and thank you very much with Tetra Tech and all that you guys do as well. We appreciate the opportunity. Is Garrett on or? Garrett is enjoying time with his son in San Diego. Okay, so tell him we wish him well. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Ms. Roaring, what's next? I believe we might have one more item in that capital project presentation. Yes, one yes. Part, a little something about Summer Crunch Prime contractor training. Yes, okay. my apologies. Part of our uh, Turner's enhancement with the uh, coming, we call it the Summer Crunch, is getting a, a, a rebalance, a refocus of all the primes uh, with a drive towards uh, safety. And what we're going to be doing with the primes for the prime contractors uh, for the uh, Group Three project is uh, is ensuring that we we have that focus for the for the summer. And what we're going to do is have them all come in and do a, a brief uh, review with them. And we're going to incorporate using visuals, uh, pictures of uh, of incidents, trying to make things you know very relatable. Um, and then also to drive our, our, our thought process of pre-planning. Let's look at what's going on to the room to the left, to the right, what we need to do uh, as far as materials, um, you know, logistics. Uh, it, and then also to talk about communication, make sure that we're all talking with each other in real time. Uh, so that if something impacts another, uh, they automatically know, they w quickly know about it, and we can uh, quickly uh, advise, uh, you know, staff if there's uh, if there's any uh, uh, concerns or anything that needs to be addressed. Then also, too, is follow through, is making sure that uh, the areas are uh, in the way we found them more or better uh, for for when uh, people come back. Some of the items that we'll talk about is thinking about the accident prevention is we look at uh, high risk. The next slide will show some some of the, the standard high risk uh, categories that we see during the summer. You know, we'll uh, also talk, uh, have pre-installation meetings uh, for, uh, for, for key items. For example, like the window replacement uh, that's going to be ongoing, that's going to be taking place at New Scotland. That's going to have its own separate pre-installation meeting. Um, and then driving the, uh, the, the need to have pre-task plans. That is where the crew that's going to install the work is planning out their activity and ensuring that uh, they're working safely. And then they'll take that plan and, and execute the work. Uh, this last slide shows uh, six of the key areas that we uh, routinely see uh, where there's potential uh, issues or where there's been issues in in the past on on our K through 12 work. Uh, one being electric, uh, working in uh, live panels, making sure lockout tag out. Um, so uh, there's there's no concerns. We do have some very um, you know heavy work in that in that department coming up. Uh, excavations, uh, making sure that things are that the excavations are secured. Um, Looking at fall protection, uh, 
you know, work, whether working on ladders, working out lifts, uh, working at the edge of buildings. We have the roof work at Arbor Hill. Uh, that's going to be very, very critical. Um, fire protection, uh, our hot work permits, making sure that the that the um, uh, all the the safety protocols are in place, proper monitoring is in place, and for steel erection uh, is ensuring that uh, you know all the proper rigging, all the uh, pre-planning is done with uh, rigging plans, and then for roofing is uh, making sure that um, you know roof openings are protected. Uh, that the proper sequence of work uh, end of day, the, the protection is in place. Uh, so if we do have rainstorms, et cetera, uh, that we're, uh, we're, we're not exposing uh, finished areas to, uh, to the elements. So that's, uh, that's the, the recap on our, on our summer crunch, uh, you know, training that we're going to do or refresher we're going to do with the primes. And that will take care of that. So I'm not sure what's next on the agenda, but that concludes. I think next we have the AIC playground discussion. Yes. It should have been in the same slideshow, so if we can get back to that one. So I can see it in the copy that's on Void Docs. Does everybody have it? Oh, here it comes. Terrific. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, bring forward tonight some work that's been done by our Playground Task Force with AIC. Um, last spring, as we know, the board approved the relocation of the and expansion of the dual language program over at Edmund O'Neill. Uh, as well as co-locating the Albany International Center and extending that down to uh, elementary grades. At that time, some parcels were identified with the Albany Land Bank in proximity to the school that may serve as new playgrounds or other um, school activity locations. The Playground Task Force was established to provide input on what they felt would be most important in that space to meet our students' needs. We have brought in our architect, Mr. Packham has uh, joined as well to bring in the AE requirements uh, around any of the site work that would need to be done. When we look at how a playground might be funded and the guidance around that, it is uh, SED does require district voters to expressly approve the use of taxpayer dollars to construct or install a playground. Playground construction may be funded through the district's operating budget or use of capital reserve funds. Uh, to be on this May's ballot, the board would need to make a decision by March 31st around the scope and how they wanted to proceed with funding. The Playground Task Force met four times with Ms. Stead. They have provided input for a new playground at 4143 North Lark, which are two of the land bank parcels that will go before the voters in May. Um, this would include age appropriate playground equipment as well as perimeter fencing for security benches, tables, uh, sunshades, areas for quiet play. Uh, they also put forward a proposal to repurpose the road behind the building and a small parcel located on 2nd Street that's adjacent that is also a parcel with the land bank that is up for voter approval in May. So this is an orientation, uh, if you will, of the area. You'll see here the, the Albany International Center. Right behind it is the Arbor Hill Community Center. Um, in the top left, the arrow pointing down is looking at 4143 North Lark Street, which is diagonally across from the school. And then, of course, the uh, arrows to the right point to the row behind the school and the small lot on 2nd Street.
This is a rendering of playground for 4143 North Lark. This would include the new playground equipment, installation of the equipment, fencing around the perimeter with gate access to maintain uh, the playground fiber and other things, the sunshade there at the foreground, as well as a table and bench for students who prefer a more quiet play. Um, you do note here in the rendering that the parcels are slightly different depth. So the playground design has been built for that. Uh, having the input on what will be the um, high priority pieces, we started to put together some costs associated with the components of the playground. Uh, that includes the equipment, which we can procure on cooperative contract at a discount. Also, the installation of the equipment, site preparation, fall protection, fencing is mentioned. Um, there is some security scope, electrical scope, and then the AE and serving pieces, surveying pieces. Pardon me. Um, we have a range right now in looking at two different contractors of anywhere from just under $247,000 to uh, about $297,000. The second proposal is for the area behind the school. This blends the road behind the school and the parcel on 2nd Street to be purchased from the Albany Land Bank. Part of the asphalt is uh, asked to remain, that that would serve for some free play, whether it be kickball or something else. Uh, request to include turf here, which you see in the foreground uh, with some goals for soccer. And then a small play area here with some swings, rock wall and playground fiber. Again, looking at a couple of different contractor possibilities for this scope of work, we again have the playground equipment and installation, the fall protection. Uh, the site preparation here is much more extensive and that's associated with the preparations for um, the turf field installation, blending the two parcels. Then looking at the artificial turf itself, uh, asphalt additions and repairs, fencing, security, lighting, um, uh, architectural engineering, again, surveying, and the totals for this uh, range from 300 and $83,000 to $403,000. Looking at some possible next steps for 4143 North Lark Street Playground, the voters would need to approve the purchase of the parcels uh, from the Albany Land Bank. The board approved the proposition language at the March 3rd meeting, so that is slated to go on the ballot on May 17th. The voters would also need to approve funding for playground construction on these parcels on May 17th, whether that be part of our, our budget proposal or a separate proposition. The play area behind the building, at this time the district does not currently own this land, so that makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, we would need to look and see if the land can be acquired from the city and what a timeline for that might be before we would be able to proceed with the second part of the proposal. Are there any questions on that? So, board colleagues, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that because of the short timeline, this level of detail would normally be discussed in facilities committee, but we're doing it a little bit more in more depth on the board floor because of the shortness of the timeline. So, um, I see board member Creechie has a question and we'll start there. Sure, I won't get into the specifics of the project because I am not a facilities committee person. Just wanted to ask what what is the potential for aid from the state in building some of these playgrounds? That is actually a little bit more complicated. Uh, we have some very specific questions out to SED facilities planning right now to see if there's maximum cost, incidental maximum cost allowance available, if this would be aidable um, with parcels that are diagonally across the street instead of on school property. Um, and there's a couple of other complex questions in there. So we are uh, waiting some additional feedback from them. We have provided everything that they've asked for at this time to give an answer. We just haven't been able to close the loop on that quite yet. So we look forward to being able to provide some additional information on that, hopefully next week. So so the the uh, dollar amounts that are presented are the 100% cost, thus the maximum the district would be paying for this. And the, the true cost could be much, much less if, if there is in fact stated. This would be the straight cost, yes. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Board Member Wilson. When it says non-discounted, that means it won't it won't be further discounted beyond what we see listed. Yes. I think it I think this is clear, but just to just to make sure, there's no reason these have to be done in the same year at the same time. We could do the playground where we have site control or we anticipate having site control if the voters approve the purchase of those small parcels. Um, and then we could do the other piece 
later or not do it later, depending on what happens with the land and all of that, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, I have another question, if nobody else does. Um, I wanted to ask what, if any, conversations have happened yet with the city, um, not about the land, which I know we still have got to work through those things, but I have um, two, two areas. One is I know that that neighborhood is severely under playgrounded. That's a word I just made up. So have we had any conversations with them about whether there is a potential for shared municipal services to try and create uh, that that little 4143 as a pocket park that would be useful for children all the time instead of just during the school day? And then a second um, and also critical question is, have we started, do they even know this is happening? Have we started talking with them about traffic safety and the fact that we're going to have kids crossing that intersection diagonally or you know, properly two streets uh, multiple times a day, so we probably need better crosswalks, maybe stop signs. I don't know what kind of traffic control is there, but it seems like a conversation we be, should be having very soon. Yes, we have not had those express conversations yet. I think the state aid question is one of the first ones we need answered before we have that first part of your question conversation, um, because that will dictate some of that conversation. But certainly the second piece is a critical piece. I understand. I, I, if I could just add, we, oh, we uh, have had some conversations with the city already regarding crossing guards, crosswalks, uh, traffic patterns, uh, both around the building in general, but also in anticipation of the playground that uh, that's coming. The city, like we are talking about a lot these days, is having trouble hiring enough staffing. So they would, they would need to, a crossing guard is, is a top priority for the principal of the building, uh, but they have not been able to find the staffing for that yet. I understand, but there's not currently traffic control at that intersection, right? It's it's no stop signs. There is a stop sign at, if you're looking at the building, which is on the right-hand side. Second. I believe there's a stop sign and a crosswalk. I believe there's a crosswalk at both. I thought there is a stop sign only at one side. Okay, but, the, but the area where the playground is going to be does not have a stop sign. It's not so a stop sign. That's yeah. correct. And we've, okay. we've talked to them about that. So stop signs are relatively inexpensive, so hopefully that's something that could be happen. Um, and then I had one more question, which is the place where we're talking about maybe putting the turf if we get site control and all of that stuff, plus it was a, wow, that's a lot of money kind of um, expense. Um, the students are using that currently, right? That's a primary play space for them. They use that during the day, is my understanding. Is that right? Yeah. Do What do we do to make sure that cars don't drive through that space while the students are there? Super Last fun. fall, we did purchase some barricades, some portable barricades for them to utilize to, to block that off during school hours so that traffic would not move through that space. We weren't able to do anything permanent because we don't have control of the space. I see. So hopefully those barricades are heavy and protective. They also, they also though, need to be somewhat um, portable for emergency, emergency vehicle access. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Well, I'll look forward to hearing more about that as part of the conversations with traffic safety. Um, anything else on this? Otherwise, um, I think we're ready to shift to budget. Everybody's like, we are so ready to shift. Let's go on to the budget. Super Deputy Superintendent Roaring, whenever you're ready to shift, we are ready to shift with you. I am ready to shift. Okay. Uh, we always start our budget development process and continue to refer back to our vision, mission, and goals to make sure that everything we're reviewing and recommending ultimately to the board aligns with those. We have a kind of a full agenda this evening, but I will move as quickly as I can. Uh, we will have a budget process update. We're going to share out the draft budget with our cost drivers, look at staffing uh, rolled into the general fund as well as plan for ARP year two, our ratios, provide an HVAC update, Revenue update, tax scenarios, tax levy history, and our multi-year projections. Uh, next Thursday, we have our first virtual community budget presentation where the public will be allowed to provide uh, very focused and specific feedback to the board on our budget. Um, we will have the proposed budget on April 6th, and we anticipate the board's adoption on April 14th. Our public hearing is May 5th, and the vote is May 17th. Some of the key terms that we've been using throughout the budget process this year include our rollover budget, which is all current staffing and programs from the general fund carried forward for the next fiscal year, along with our known contractual obligations. And this year we've added the modified rollover budget, which is the rollover budget plus items that will be transferred from our one-time federal dollars to the general fund for the next fiscal year. 
The rollover budget includes the continuation of existing programs and services, contractual obligations, district operations, staffing, and benefits under our labor contracts. The modified rollover budget includes all of that, plus absorption of identified programs and staffing funded with one-time dollars in 21-22. It does not include new staffing requests addressing mandates that require more resources or other items considered to be essential for programming health and safety. Our modified rollover budget adjustments included the renewal of our HVAC preventive maintenance contract, funding a pool maintenance contract, restoring the uh, extended day night school program at a brook into the 2019-20 funding level, additional behavior specialists and social worker positions, as well as mandated nursing positions that were added during 21-22. Additional modified rollover budget adjustments to maintain current programs and operations also included increasing funding for software licenses to build those in that were previously funded by grants, increasing technology hardware to support Chromebook replacement now that we're one-to-one, -one, and increasing funding for hall monitor and maintenance overtime to support our after school programming and facilities use more typical prior to the pandemic. In terms of fun, or different identified programs to roll in from service and ARP included our Albany International Center and dual language program expansion, as well as the Tony Clement Center for Education and identified faculty support in administrative positions. Adjustments as of March 17th include uh, an adjustment to the employer's contribution rate for the employee's retirement system, uh, reduction in our anticipated health insurance increase, adjustments in positions, including those absorbed from one-time federal dollars, uh, an increase in our BOCES expense based on updated cost information and additional services that we have requested. Most of summer school has been moved to the grants for 2022, and we have acknowledged the charter school tuition rate increase, but brought down our assumption of additional students next year. Our draft budget includes additional security personnel and equipment, additional maintenance equipment funds for snow removal and school deliveries, additional ENL teachers based on 22-23 enrollment projections to provide mandated services, another speech therapist for the same reason, additional custodial workers to support additional square footage following construction in several schools, and our square foot to worker industry standard ratio in our buildings, looking at an increase in transportation to fund additional tripper buses, uh, increase in sports supervision as we return to regular competition levels and grow the program. And then last meeting, we introduced the uh, feedback that we were hearing about increase in energy expenses, and we are uh, adding a number for that here of about $875,000 for gas and electric. This is a prorated number. It reflects the cost for eight months next year based on everything we're getting now in terms of estimates for our new contract. This slide is uh, new to you this evening. This is the staffing rolled into the general fund, either from one-time funds added to meeting requirements or positions that were added to the general fund during the 21-22 fiscal year that were not part of our adopted budget. There are a number of titles here and it tells in the far right-hand column what the funding source was in 21-22, so you know where that comes from. At the bottom, we get to a total of 116 positions. This slide represents the staffing that's planned to remain in ARP at this time for 22-23. Uh, some of these positions were in ARP in 21-22, some may not have been. Uh, the total for next year planned is 82 positions to remain in ARP. So when we look at the staffing adds to the general fund, uh, we had 84.8 or just by 85 positions from federal funds roll in. And then general fund adds during 22-23 and 21-22 and 23-24 are 31.3 for a total of 116.1. This is our first uh, view of the staffing ratio slide. This information will be updated uh, when we provide our next budget update. We will have a, another column on the far right that will be the proposed 22-23 staffing. This is an all fund staffing report, so it is not strictly the general fund, though the budget conversation is. Um, but you'll see here where we are with our uh, ratios at the bottom in terms of staff to students. Looking at our cost drivers in the budget, uh, we started out with a benefits assumption of $3.5 million year over year, and we are down to $1.88 million. This is attributable to the reduction in the employer's contribution rate for ERS, as well as a, a reduction in what we are anticipating for our health insurance increase next year. Um, unlike last year where we were at 10%, this year we're at three, which is fantastic. 
Uh, we have an increase in salary expense year over year of just under $9.6 million. And again, a large portion of that is attributable to the 116 positions going into the general fund for next year. Our BOCES adjustments are hardware and software uh, adjustments for technology, maintenance, which includes additional funds for the contract services, supplies and equipment. Security equipment at 62,000, our utilities at just under $875,000. And then the charter school tuition, we started out with an assumption of 110 additional students and we're down to 30. So that has pulled back as well, um, 1.36 million. Overall, we have a $17.97 million year over year increase or just about $478,000 less than when we started. So when we look at the adopted budget for 21-22 and the draft budget for 22-23, that is a year over year difference of 17.974 million. That is a 6.65% increase. But it is really important to understand where that comes from. The district is continuing to build back what was prior to the pandemic, which is including funding for facilities use, sports supervision, night school. Um, it also includes rolling in some of those positions that we had in the general fund prior to the pandemic that were um, brought back with one-time federal dollars. This increase also includes funding for 31 new positions in the general fund to meet program requirements, additional maintenance contracts for preventive maintenance and pools, additional equipment funds for maintenance and security. Those details again were captured on slides 7 through 12 and on 16. Shifting gears for a minute and providing an HVAC update, uh, BPI Mechanical does provide our service repairs and preventive maintenance on all of our HVAC equipment. In October of 21, the board approved a, an annual preventive maintenance contract on our HVAC equipment and work commenced immediately after. Some of the challenges that we faced include components in the equipment failing, deferred maintenance, and our building management system communication and aged components. BPI has received 175 work orders between July 1st and March 11th across the district, including temperature issues, leaking valves and boilers, bearings, chillers, pumps, complete system replacements, and two of our data closets. They have also they've responded to the 175 HVAC service repair work orders on a 24 hour basis. Um, whether it's been holidays, weekends, evenings, they've been out as we've called them. Below is financial information for each of the two contracts that we have with BPI for the 21-22 school year. The first is our repair and service contract. That is a contract that the district has had annually with them for some time. That current contract value not to exceed is $865,000. That contract started on July 1st. At this time, we have spent just under $650,000. The preventive maintenance contract started on October 8th, and that had a not to exceed of 686,000, pardon me. And right now we're just under $174,000 of expense billed to date. So that had a total contract value across the two of 1.5 million, and we are around 822,000 right now. In 2021, we learned that the current building management system was in need of an upgrade. Some of the system components would need to be replaced. Technology would need to be upgraded to allow for more consistent management and control. The district reviewed building management system options from multiple contractors and selected a partner with day automation. We learned that the upgrade and conversion would cost the district about $6 million district wide. Uh, when funding became available through the American Rescue Plan, we this was a permissible component for HVAC and we prioritized this upgrading conversion of our building management system in all of our buildings, with the exception of Albany High School, who's getting a new building management system under the construction project ongoing there. Uh, we allocated $6.2 million in our ARP plan to cover this expense. The Board of Education approved contracts back in July of 21 and August of 21 with day automation for this comprehensive work. We asked Day Automation to commit to completing this work in a very aggressive timeline of 18 months, and currently they are on target to do that. The total project cost again is $6.25 million, and I believe that we have a supplementary document that outlines the buildings and the anticipated date of completion that's been shared out with you as well, so you have that timeline. Shifting to revenue, uh, the governor's proposed budget had $2.1 billion increase in education funding and $1.6 billion of that was to fund foundation aid increases. We are in year two of a three year path to fully funding foundation aid and we anticipate the final uh, allocation for 
It continues our community school set aside as well as fully funding expense based aids and continuation of all categorical aids. It did include a charter school tuition rate increase of 4.7%, which is typically what we have seen over the last few years. Um, and it did propose a new program of $100 million over two years matching funds for social, emotional, and academic supports for students. We're waiting to see if this becomes part of the adopted budget. We have four different categories of revenue. We have our local, which is primarily property taxes, but also tax on consumer utilities and payments in lieu of taxes. State is, uh, includes our star reimbursement, our foundation aid, categorical funding, and our BOCES special service aid. Federal aid includes Medicaid assistance and E-rate, and then our other category includes our interest earnings, any district billings, appropriated fund balance and reserves, as well as rebates and refunds largely associated with our health insurance program. Our state aid adjustments since February 10th, or the initial projection we gave you in February 10th, which was based on the governor's runs, the updated database showed a decrease in our foundation aid of just about $953,000. That also showed a significant increase in our building aid of $1.5 million, with a net gain of just over $402,000. So when we take our estimate revenue estimate by source, we will see the significant increase in state aid of $15.7 million attributable to the increase in foundation aid and building aid. We also have an increase in our federal aid anticipated next year uh, due to Medicaid reimbursements. And we have modified our um, appropriated fund balance from the last meeting and added the $275,000 to that to offset the increase uh, expense side for transportation. So that now shows a net positive rather than a negative or decrease from the last one, which takes us to a difference of $16.3 million adopted 21-22 to current projection for 22-23. So when we look at the year over or year over year increase again, that's $16.3 million. We're continuing to review and update. We are optimistic that the state budget will be on time this year, so we will know what our state aid is uh, by beginning of April. It's important to note that this does include the February state aid adjustment increase of just under $403,000. It does increase the use of appropriated fund balance by $275,000, continues use of restrictive reserves by $600,000, and continues to assume a flat property tax levy. So when we look at the revised revenue projections and the draft budget, the difference between those two is a gap of $1.6 million. Some different tax levy scenarios. Our allowable levy limit is 2.4%. Uh, 2% tax levy would be 2.4 million, 1% would be 1.2 million, and half a percent would be $606,000. Again, the current revenue estimate includes zero increase in the tax levy, and our budget gap remains at 1.6 million. When we look at the history of the tax levy, our six year average is 1.04%. The district's tax levy increase has been less than 2% for the last six years. So this is our first look at a multi-year projection as part of our budget development process this year. This first slide assumes a 0% tax levy for fiscal year 22-23 as well as 23-24 and 24-25. So this is a three-year look. It also continues to assume a consistent use of appropriated fund balance and Restricted reserves in 24 25 at $3 million, but acknowledges the increase of $275,000 now for 22 23. It does include the assumption of an increase in foundation aid for next year um, to fully fund, as well as an adjustment for our building aid in 24. And then in fiscal year 25, it assumes a 5% foundation aid increase, as well as an adjustment for our building aid. So you'll see uh, right now we have the $1.6 million gap. Right. As the projection sits and for expenses and revenues next year, we would have a gap of 2.2. And then in the third year where the uh, foundation aid would be considered fully funded based on the three year phase in, we would have a gap of 8.3. This uh, slide has the same assumptions for every category except local. In this slide, we assume a 1% tax levy increase each year for three years. You'll note at the bottom that we have a gap of $443,000 at that juncture for 22-23.
we would actually be in the black for 23-24. And then for 24-25, that reduces the gap to 4.67 million. Our remaining budget variables are state aid and our tax levy. Our next steps include finalizing district priorities, incorporating new information as it becomes available, responding to any questions, incorporating feedback, and continuing our lobby efforts until the budget is enacted. I know that you're looking at a board <clears throat> who's been through a very, very long week and has just experienced a rather detailed numerical presentation. So I do not know how many coherent questions can be asked at this time. Luckily, we're not expected to adopt the budget this week or that would be really ugly. We have a couple more weeks. I do want to see if anyone has questions. I know people have been asking questions one on one with the deputy superintendent as we've needed to over the last week as we reviewed these slides. Um, but meanwhile, for uh, the good of the order, board, board member Craig. I had a question about staffing ratios and it was uh, the staffing ratios on slide. I think it's slide 15. Are those staffing ratios for just general fund positions or for or for everybody? And do we have anticipated staff ratios for 22-23? This is an all fund, so it would include our school lunch as well as any grants and general fund. And we are anticipating our next budget update would include the proposed 22-23 staffing ratios. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to just draw attention to as we look at these multi-year slides is that, if I understand correctly, they anticipate us um, continuing the staffing at, at the level at the level that it is now. Um, basically, every position that's currently funded by ARP or Sarissa maintained. But I know that when we established the plan, uh, when I, when that happened, that we had anticipated allowing positions to drop off the budget by attrition as people retired or as people left. Um, so while I know that that's not booked in the budget, I'm just wondering if operationally that those thoughts are happening about how, like, do we have to replace every single retiree and all of those things as they're coming off? That, those decisions would be made, Madam President, members of the board, those decisions would be made, you know, based on the needs of the district and seeing where we are. We're in the process of looking at what are some of those vacancies that we've had to still deliver services and how we've done some of those workarounds because it's more so in the vacancies where we may be able to absorb some of those positions. The retirees, uh, it depends on that position and then what our next steps are. So short answer is yes, that's in the process, looking at that attrition, looking, looking at what we're going to continue to move forward, but also looking at, you know, where those are, where areas exist where those positions may not be filled. I understand. And you know, I know that the need is almost infinite. We could always use more staff, but we are, um, you know, when you look at the multi year projections, it's very clear what that how dependent we are on these large, large increases of foundation aid, <clears throat> which will not continue indefinitely. So and, and I would add that um, we are that is not infinite. We know that that ends. And so um, this is why we're trying to make sure that people can see clearly what the impact of a tax levy would be and then looking at decisions that we have to make with regard to programming moving forward. Where are those true one time funds, which we're showing those things um, that you can see are the must haves to roll over uh, because it does make a big difference. And that's why we have to really be very strategic uh, because it's not an infinite pot of money. It is it is finite. Anyone else? I think we have hit a wall at this time and we'll look forward to further budgetary conversations. Um, the next board meeting is not until April. March 31st, March 31st. OK, so we have one more before we'll have any real clue about the state budget. OK, so uh, if there's nothing else, then I think we have committee reports on the agenda. So I have to say the word committee reports, but I tell you, your board colleagues will kill you if your committee report is more than one minute long. So anyone with a very efficient committee report is welcome. Board Member Krejci. Thank you. Uh, there was a wellness committee meeting yesterday. Unfortunately, due, due to another commitment, I had to leave before the meeting finished, but the discussion was about uh, the survey that they do it, originally this in the past, the survey has been only of principals and, and school staff. 
about how implementation of the wellness policy is going, but they're looking to get a little more holistic and also uh, survey parents and students both on how the wellness policy is going and what do they think could be helpful to add for their physical and emotional wellness. That's it. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and very efficient update. Board Member Wilson. I attended a portion of AFE's board meeting as a liaison, and they, of course, are encouraging people to apply for their grants, and they have a fundraiser on April 1st. Thank you very much. Excellent efficiency. Anyone else with a committee report? Seeing none. Any other business? Seeing none. May I entertain a motion to adjourn? Board Member Wilson, <laughs> second by Board Member Elvin Yawi. All in favor, have a good night, everyone. I will see you in two.